If you think about the solutions though, organizations are no longer limited to the high cost options of keeping more inventory and building redundant capacity. Accenture research shows that companies which have a greater supply chain visibility are more likely to maintain revenue, profit, share price performance during the periods of disruption. And how is that possible? Called the intelligent visibility. Having a data capability and flowing and having the ability to have a visibility of your end-to-end -end supply chain, as well as having a accurate reflection of what's happening in your supply chain with all the dynamic visibility leads to the fact that you can control your cost and your performance better. All roads lead not just the technology and data and artificial intelligence, but actually how organizations are using these insights to transform the organization. With greater rigor applied to data and analytics, this has become a key enabling for organizations to actively report also on ESG performance for scope one, two, and three emissions and their reductions, as well as understanding what your risk on the modern slavery act as an example are. Think about cybersecurity. According to the World Economic Forum's global cybersecurity outlook, it was found that business and cyber leaders support effective enforcement of regulatory environments. This is not to suggest that organizations are actively requesting more regulatory scrutiny of their own activities, but rather they believe properly enforced regulations will raise quality of cybersecurity across the sector, the supply chains, which will in turn make their business less prone to collateral damage from attacks and other organizations. In relation to supply chain risk and resilience, the cybersecurity report observed that larger firms typically have small and medium organizations in their supply chain and consider them as critical partners. When these critical partners are taken out of action through the technical and financial fallout from the cyber incident, the entire ecosystem, including the larger organizations is negatively affected. In the absence of full insurance, Organizations actually would do well focusing on initiatives that support ecosystem resilience. By increasing the level of protection across their supply chain, organizations will enhance their cyber resilience of their own operations. And finally, when it comes to talent and skills, reskilling will be needed. Looking ahead, leaders are exploring how human ingenuity and technology can create more advanced autonomous supply chain and driving those right insights and of the data you can get to build that resilience in your supply chain going forward. With the right skills, organizations will be better placed to build, as I said, resilience, but they can also then take the right proactive steps to uh, mitigate those issues, as well as protecting the supply chain and anticipate the future disruptions. But most importantly, take the advantage of the future growth opportunities lies ahead. In conclusion, we hope you will enjoy today's event. We have a diverse range of speakers today and a panel and industry experts. As we, will, uh, we are all navigating a new era of disrupted supply chain amidst our complex geopolitical operating environment. I look forward to meeting you also, many of you during the day. So thank you very much and welcome. Um, thanks, Sari. Really set the scene, I think, for um, the topics that we're going to be discussing today. Um, to get us going in terms of our first conversation on stage, uh, we're going to start off with a global perspective. And I'm glancing at my screen, hoping that soon we're going to see Dr. Joshua Meltzer, who is the Senior Fellow Global Economy and Development from the Bookings Institute. While we're waiting for Josh to jump on. Oh, can you see him? I can't see him. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm flying blind here. Hi, Josh. <laughs> um, for those of you in the room, um, we've got 20 minutes with Josh, and so if you want to ask a question, uh, jump on the QR code on your table, and if you wouldn't mind putting it in pigeonhole, that'll allow us to work through as many questions as possible, uh, rather than moving Mike around the room. So, Josh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I know it's uh, late in your neck of the woods, and I really appreciate you making the time available. Um, 
we sort of set the scene here in the room by talking about how big a shock the COVID pandemic has been, obviously, to supply chains. Uh, we've got the uh, war in Europe uh, and uh, some complexity in the global economy like we haven't seen for a while. So perhaps the best place to start is to understand from you how you're seeing global supply chains. Um, Greg, you can hear me okay? Yep, all good. And I can see you now, which is fantastic. That's even better. Um, no, well, well, it, it's, it's great to be here. And uh, thank you for the invitation. So, um, you know, I, I live and work in uh, Washington, and I'm going to sort of come at this to some extent from a US perspective, even though I'm obviously um, Australian, I'll, I'll try to bridge the gap it's where I can. Um, but, you know, the supply chain piece is really front and centre for, for the Biden administration, and, and I think for industry, um, you know, generally, and it's got it's got multiple components to it. I, I think certainly the you know the pandemic and, and the shock from COVID has um, been been part of it, but it's 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 actually not front and center any longer in the discussion around what you know matters and what the what the vulnerabilities are with respect to supply chains any longer. I, I'd say that for, for the US, it it is very much about the um, trade and economic relationship with China, supply chains that are China-centric and the types of risks and vulnerabilities uh, this creates. So I don't want to say that the COVID piece is not there, but I think it's really become a second order issue. I think there are elements which have been worked on around medical supplies and so forth, but I think the energy and the focus is very much on, on what that means with respect to China. And for the US, it's it's um it, there's a couple of elements to that some which are i think familiar for australia some which are certainly a little different for the you know just to put it in, in a bit of a context i guess the china is is is, is the united states third largest export uh you know market so that it actually trades a lot more with canada and mexico than it does with China, but it's an enormous trade deficit. It's a very unbalanced uh, trade relationship. I think the deficit um, was in the vicinity of $550 billion or something um, recently and, and keeps growing. So despite the fact that there are these 25% tariffs on a lot of goods still from the Trump era, trade is actually at an all-time high between the US and China. And the, the concern is, and this I think resonates in Australia, is the types of interdependencies create vulnerabilities. So opportunities for economic coercion, um, opportunities to disrupt supply chains where critical products, you know, are being sourced primarily from China. Uh, and because the US-China geopolitical tensions are very much focused on key technologies, digital technologies such as quantum computing, AI, and so forth, uh, access to semiconductors, chips, know-how, and the types of um, inputs that are needed to produce a lot of the digital technologies, including the data itself, actually gets wrapped up in, in this supply chain discussion. And so that that has meant that the, um, the US is, uh, what, what the US is thinking about at the moment is, is, is how to respond to that and what's, what's commercially, realistically and sustainable and that will produce alternative, you know, this notion of more resilient, secure supply chains um, that will be uh, competitive over the long term. I, I will say that it's important to also consider the flip side because the United States is also very much, in a sense, weaponized this economic interdependence between the US and China around access to semiconductors and cutting edge digital technologies um, in response to its strategic concerns about China. So we've had a whole suite of export controls put in place which prevent access to cutting edge chips, um, ac access to the types of um, machinery that actually makes the chips. There's actually now limits on the ability for people to actually go and work in China on these types of technologies and so forth. And it affects not just US companies, but actually anything produced anywhere in the world which contains US IP and, and products. And so it affects a lot of other entities and, and industry globally. Uh, so so this is this is very much a two-way street here. Um, but the bottom line is on a on a supply chain front, we are we are definitely beginning to see a disentanglement of US China supply chains around these core critical sensitive uh, supply chains and products. And the ones that I would identify 
for the US at least, are certainly around chips and semiconductors, but it will also increasingly be around uh, the new generation electric vehicles and the critical minerals that go into producing the batteries, the batteries themselves, a lot of clean energy products um, as well. We'll see that more in pharmaceuticals, which have also been identified and biotechnology as well. So some of these leading edge technologies where the US is determined to maintain sort of a cutting edge lead globally, um, part of that will be that it's going to rely a lot less on Chinese based supply chains in, in, in that space, at least. Yeah, really interesting observation, I think, Josh, and certainly the conversation that we've sort of started setting up here and the pressures that we're seeing in Australia, I think there's certainly strategic elements of it, but also a lot of business pressure, if I could put it that way, reflecting this massive global disruption through COVID, but also some of the strategic challenges and geopolitical challenges that you've outlined, um, but just the inflationary environment and the macro environment, um, US I think obviously very focused on, from your comments on the strategic challenges, positioning themselves both in terms of digital transformation and decarbonisation. But can you speak at all, like if you're looking at the broader um, economic sort of conversation in the country, how is business in, in the US sort of grappling with this more in a sort of BAU sort of sense? Are, are they sort of, how are they reframing their supply chain conversation? So the, the term that gets thrown around in, in the US is a lot of this notion of, and, and, and similarly in, in Australia, but, but in the US in particular, this notion of reshoring and, and French shoring, and that, that is increasingly, I think, a, um, a reorientation towards what's possible to do more of in North America, uh, particularly um, with, the, with the, new, the newly renegotiated USMCA, the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement that has sort of replaced NAFTA, the um, there's a lot of bipartisan support for that agreement um, for various reasons and that has sort of created a new opportunity I think to rethink what's possible in North America and particularly what's possible with respect to Mexico as got as an alternative sort of lower labor cost destination and so that's definitely a big part um, of the conversation at the moment though what you'll also see is that the um, there's also a, a discussion around how do you bring allies along and what role do they play in rebuilding supply chains that are more concentrated amongst trusted partners and I think this notion of trusted partners will increasingly be a lens or a frame through which these decisions get looked at more closely so that includes clearly the EU the US and the EU have recently sort of been negotiating a critical minerals pact to bring them in to some of the benefits that are accruing under the Inflation Reduction Act. Similarly with Japan, um, a similar agreement has just been reached. And so these are all efforts that are sort of out there to try to bring other countries into this space. Industry, if, if you look at the macro data, there's, there's not a lot there to support the narrative of large amounts of reshoring or, or reinvestment of manufacturing into Mexico, though one would expect that this data will take a while, this will take a lot to show up in the data in any meaningful sense. Anecdotally, there is some of that going on. Mexico is a challenging destination. The reality of Mexico is that it's just not as competitive, it's ease of doing business and its connectivity, it's the quality of its labor force is, is just not as good as China or in, in fact any a lot of the East Asia sort of peer economies where you would imagine some of this um, manufacturing may be brought back to Mexico. So there's a lot that Mexico needs to do to kind of improve its investment climate and its place um, as just a, a to invest and, and to grow the manufacturing sector. So that's work in progress and needs to happen if this is going to be an ambition that's going to be realised. It's also the case that it's not that businesses are getting out of China en masse. It's, it's, you've probably heard of this China plus one strategy where businesses are still definitely in China for, ch for the Chinese market, but are looking to sort of develop alternative supply chains where they're supplying to the rest of the world. Mm. So you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, and not surprisingly, it's one of the first questions that I've got from the audience. It's um, entered our conversations pretty quickly, I think, given the scale of um, of the program, if you like. And so I'm interested in the question that we've got is, you know, what what are you seeing as the early indications of the impact of the Inflation um, Reduction Act? And you've talked about, you know, obviously the US looking for other strategic partners. You know, we see ourselves, obviously Australia is, is looking to that too. We've got the AUKUS agreement. How should we be thinking about the Inflation Reduction Act and, and the potential for us? I mean, I mean, quite frankly, we're seeing it as a challenge um, on the investment side, amongst other things. But 
you know, what's the landscape there? What's the impact? And where do you think Australia fits into this equation? I, I think overall, Australia is potentially quite well placed um, in, in this new environment. I mean, there's going to be real challenges with respect to China, but let me just bracket that for the moment, at least with respect to the United States. The um, There's elements of the Inflation Reduction Act which work well for Australia. So to be brought into the benefits. So when it comes to electric vehicles and batteries and um, the amount of kind of value added that's got to happen within Amer in North America, it's also got to be, you, you, you get included in that calculation if you have a free trade agreement with the United States, which Australia does. Australia's obviously got a lot of capacity, particularly in critical minerals, which will feed into the development of batteries. And there's actually a lot of work underway looking at what more Australia can do on that front. And Australia just broadly is a very trusted partner when it comes to you know the United States so I think that what Australia can do economically would be very welcome in in, in Washington and in the United States um, in terms of contributing to building these kind of more trusted and secure supply chains the IRA though having said all that presents challenges for allies including Australia because it was also drafted in a way which included some buy-in for countries with FTAs as I mentioned but it's also got these huge tax credits such as the advanced manufacturing tax credit which is based on a percentage of um I think it's OPEX so it's, it's actually unlimited I mean they've done they've made estimates of what it will look like and so everyone's quoting those numbers but uh you know if it actually goes higher it goes higher so it's just a percentage of OPEX so um you know it's a huge uh financial opportunity for firms that are based in the United States and you're seeing the Canadians and the Mexicans and others in Europe getting very concerned about this uh, Canadian budget that's going to come out actually recently is expected to respond to that by actually providing Canadian tax benefits to keep manufacturing of electric vehicles and batteries in Canada in response to the IRA and everyone's subsidizing some of this at the moment. So the challenge is going to be how do you navigate these subsidies in a way that we're not kind of out subsidizing each other in a very inefficient way. So that's, I think, the next area that's going to have to be under discussion amongst allies. So there's some good news, there's some challenging news, but I think overall, given the trusted relationship that Australia has with the United States, there's a lot of opportunity there. Mm. Um, obviously, a lot of focus on this long-term China sort of strategic uh, risk, if you like, to supply chain resilience in the US. I've got a question from the audience as well around, you know, what are the other sort of, um, you know, future looking emerging risks that, that we might need to be thinking about? Um, obviously, cyber is front, front of mind, but uh, in our introductory comments from Sari from Accenture, we, she also talked about extreme weather events. And of course, we've seen some of those in the US recently. What's the longer term conversation around some of these other risks? Is it has it got focus and what would you be identifying? Yeah, I, I think um, so. I think it's undoubtedly the case that we're in a moment of geopolitical upheaval that is probably unprecedented. I don't think we've seen anything like it. Certainly, I don't think even the fall of the Berlin Wall in, in various ways necessarily um, is, is, a, is a good sort of um, historical analogy. And you might even have to go back to World War II. I mean, the, the, the changes that are underway, I think, in the global system are, are huge and we're only at the beginning of them. And so there are risks that are potentially there in, in multiple different directions. The, the risk of what is sort of turning into, for want of a better word, a Cold War between the US and China, it's not a Cold War like it was with Russia. Um, but, you know, it's a hardening of divisions uh, that doesn't look like it's going to ease in any foreseeable future, uh, has got real risks of turning into a hot war, uh, certainly over Taiwan. Um, Taiwan, 90% of the world's semiconductors are located in Taiwan with TSMC. Uh, that's part of the reason that the US is now subsidising heavily to get some of the high-end chip production back into the United States, really as a security um, investment or an insurance investment in the event that uh, TSMC is taken offline in the event of a conflict or a blockade of some sort. And so th these are possibilities that have always been there, but I think yeah, a, re a risk that are just going up in the, the, rather than going down, it was obviously seeing what's happened with Russia and Ukraine. You get a more formal commitment by China to uh, supplying Russia with any type of military equipment. I, I think the the level of tension and and conflict goes up another couple of levels if, if that ever happens. Um, so you know, they're, 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 and they're just a couple that 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 I can mention at the moment. We haven't even spoken about North Korea um, and and the type of climate risks that you're talking about. So I think there's a lot of new risks out there um, that that we need to be thinking about a lot more carefully. 
And what role do you see um, for some of the global institutions that we've relied on so much in the past to sort of set the rules of the game? And of course, I'm thinking about the World Trade Organization or you know, others that have kind of kept things as tidy as they might. <laughs> you can see, you know, you're expecting those to be completely overhauled, not have the voice that they used to. What future there? Well, you know, you, the, Russia's just assumed um, chair of the UN Security Council, which I think sort of is one example that underscores how um, e e how poorly set up I think a lot of these international institutions are going to be for the current environment we've found ourselves in. If you go back to pre-fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, 1980s, uh, in, you know, the, U you not, you, the UN in particular was was largely defunct. I mean, the, National, the Security Council didn't work, obviously, because the five permanent members, which include Russia and, and, and the United States at the time just didn't agree. And so, you know, it wasn't really able to operate effectively at all. The World Trade Organization only came into effect on the 1st of January, 1995. Before that was the GAD, it was a much smaller um, gathering of, of countries. And so this, this environment we've been in for the last, uh, you know, sort of 30 odd years where international organizations have been somewhat effective, the UN Security Council has been able to operate, the WTO has been very effective up until recently has been really a symptom of a, a period when the US was very much the hegemon and there were you know there was little pushback and everyone had bought into a particular kind of agenda around a rules-based international order that that area that period is clearly over and so there's going to be very significant implications for the way that any of these international organizations are going to be effective. I think this is just a proxy for saying international cooperation is just going to be really hard. Um, the WTO is, is more or less on its last legs. Uh, it's not to say that it's going to disappear. And I think it's still got a, an opportunity to do some good work in specific areas like fisheries, um, and there may be an outcome on e-commerce of, of some minimal level of ambition. But the type of WTO, which has had a very effective dispute settlement function, has been a forum for major trade negotiating, ne negotiating rounds is, is over. And so it's no longer going to be the place where we're going to make major meaningful progress on trade. We're going to be doing it in much smaller groupings um, that will reflect the geopolitical divisions. It's not going to include China. It's going to be much more focused around a US-centered group and so forth. Um, similarly, when one thinks about you know, this national, you know, international security around the UN and so forth. So we are going to have to be rebuilding cooperation internationally um, as we go, uh, because these, these organizations that we're leaning on for the last 30 years, I think are going to be ineffective given the divisions that we're seeing at the moment. Mm. I knew we were going to run out of time, Josh, and my team's going to um, be giving me dirty looks, but I do have one question which I'm going to ask, which cobbles together two questions in the in the pigeonhole app that we're using, which basically I think boils down to the same thing. You talked about Mexico um, and its importance potentially to the US. You talked about China plus one. I think the question is, who, who should Australia's plus one be? Um, you know, who's our Mexico or should, should India be our plus one? Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, I, I, do, I don't, so I think, uh, again, I, I think Australia is, um, Australia's going to have a, a bunch of, the, the core challenge for Australia is is how to navigate the China challenge, given how um, incredibly dependent Australia is on China for, for its exports, the economic coercion that China has shown Australia and hasn't stopped. Uh, where, you know, it, it's sort of, I think it's receded in the headlines because some alternative markets have been found for some of these exports, but this is kind of a long-term part of the relationship and China's clearly going to try to diversify some of its core you know, imports, iron ore and so forth away from Australia. It's going to take time. So the bilateral relationship, I think, will be okay for a bit um, on the economic front, but I don't think, I think there's risks in the long term. So how does it manage that at a time when the national security space is 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 becoming tighter and harder, and the the you know Australia is deeply um, you know committed to the 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 alliance with with the United States and the broader Western world that is seeking to sustain what is becoming a, you know a, a set of democratic kind of rules orientated countries um, pushing back against authoritarian China. That's a challenge. Australia, though, is very well situated in in that it has a very complex and sophisticated range of trade agreements with China. 
um, with a lot of the its major, with really all its major trading partners. So, the, so the so it's on the economic front, the decline in the WTO is 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 offset by these opportunities that have been created. Australia is involved in some of these sort of so-called China-centric regional trade arrangements like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, as well as the sort of Western US focused ones like the CPTPP, which obviously the US is no longer in, but was, you know, the leader of before it left. Um, so I'm, I, I think Australia is reasonably well positioned, um, given where we are at, uh, though I think the, the course ahead is going to be very, very challenging. Well, Josh, thank you so much for your time and particularly so late uh, your time, but um, we really appreciate your insights and uh, really appreciate you joining us for the conversation. Have a good evening. Pleasure. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. So it's now my great pleasure to ask Jared Ball, CETA's Chief Economist, uh, to come up to stage and introduce the next session. And I'll apologise for stealing two minutes of his time. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Melinda. Uh, always putting me under pressure. It's good to good to keep me on my toes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to be moderating this session on the criticality of interconnected infrastructure. Uh, and I think my, my reflection looking at the um, list of people that we've got on the panel today is that it's not every day that you get uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of people who represent different nodes of a complex uh, interconnected logistics network on the one stage. Uh, and of course, this is because they are the very people who keep our planes, trains, ships, warehouses, trucks uh, running on time. So it's an absolute pleasure to be able to have this conversation uh, with a number of representatives across that network today. Uh, and so if I could welcome them onto the stage, we've got Saul Cannon, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Port of Melbourne. We've got Dr. Hermione Parsons, the CEO of the Australian Logistics Council. We've got Justin Portelli, uh, the General Manager Strategy from Melbourne Airport. Uh, and joining virtually, hopefully on the screen, Jan Vandermeer, there he is. Uh, who is the Director of Supply Chain Project Delivery at CBRE. Uh, as per the last session, uh, we'll have questions on uh, pigeonhole. Uh, so uh, as Melinda mentioned, the QR code is there on your tables. Uh, and also if you would like to raise a question in the room, we can obviously get a microphone to you for that. Um, so we've already heard today about, I think, these layers of impacts on the supply chain since COVID, uh, not, not just the pandemic, but geopolitical changes, economic shocks, uh, policy changes as well. So I think it's interesting just to start, I think, by taking stock on where we're at in the different nodes of our supply chain uh, and, and how those shocks have worked through the system and, and where we are at this point. And perhaps I can start with you, Saul, and, and work through the different nodes uh, on our panel. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the port environment and, and where do you think we're at? Are, are we now in, I guess, a, a constant state of evolution and, and shocks and impacts in terms of our supply chains that we, as Melinda started off saying, used to take for granted? Sure, and maybe I could start by just a couple of reflections on uh, Melinda and then the, the session just with Josh to, to bring it into talking about some port, in, uh, some port and other related impacts and shocks in our worlds. Um, but the first thing would be, as Melinda said, who would have thought going back three plus years ago uh, that supply chains would be on the front page of global newspapers in the way they have? And so the big reflection for me, as I look back over the COVID experience and a range of other impacts is just how interconnected we are right across the end to end supply chain. And that's not just a supply chain within Australia, it's the very much the end to end global supply chain that we all rely on. So, um, so maybe a couple of port examples to illustrate that if we were sitting here um, 12, 12 or so months ago, we might have been talking about the bunching of container ships outside in the Port of Melbourne and some of the congestion we were seeing here. Um, a range of things led to that uh, back at the time. So uh, pandemic impacts, whether it was the shutdown of factories in China or the shutdown of ports in China, uh, what it meant was the schedule of vessels and the way they arrived in our waters here in Australia was totally uh, turned on its head. So pre-pandemic, 
um, the, the number of or percentage of ships that used to turn up within their scheduled berthing windows at the various ports around Australia uh, would be sort of 60 plus percent. COVID saw that totally flip around and it was below 10%. And so what that means is, while we might look here and we look at the, the infrastructure and the port capacity that we have in place, when you get a whole lot of a vessel, uh, you, you might have a berth empty, but then you get a whole of, lot of vessels all arriving at the same time. And that leads to a, a big bunching of, of vessels and the congestion. And we see the flow through impacts of that right up and down the supply chain. It wasn't just COVID impacts. Um, Extreme weather events, you know, shutting down rail lines in different parts of Australia has flow on impacts, uh, some flood, uh, some floods. So we saw flood levels up in Brisbane at one point, shut the port of Brisbane for five days. That has flow on impacts with vessels changing uh, how they call it ports and bypassing certain ports and what that means in terms of the, the volumes and goods that need to flow through different, uh, different other uh, points of entry and different other modes of transport. Um, the interesting thing today, if we sit here, is the auto supply chain. So 12 months ago, we might have uh, focused and talked more about container ships. Uh, today, uh, there's a lot of headlines and talk about uh, cars. So is anyone waiting for a new car at the moment? Uh, a few, and I, I won't ask how long because you may have been waiting for a number of months and there still is a lot of congestion. Um, and this is interesting because it goes back to, in fact, uh, something that Josh was talking about. One of the big factors driving the congestion and impacts in the auto supply chain at the moment goes back to the global shortage of semiconductor chips. And what, it, uh, what, what happened was a lot of the overseas car manufacturers, the, you know, the factories were still running, they were producing vehicles. They sat in storage and they sat in paddocks or fields or wherever they could be parked. And in Australia, we have, quite understandably, very, very strict biosecurity and quarantine requirements. And so what we're seeing at the moment is a real spike in the failure rates so in terms of biosecurity risk material of a number of the cars that haven't been properly cleaned. Uh, they might have insects or seeds or other uh, uh, risk material that's uh, you know, a, a problem for us in Australia. So a big part of the congestion that we're seeing at the moment um, is around ultimately here, the need to uh, clean and have those uh, biosecurity checks all done in the right way. Uh, but it flows right back uh, through the supply chain and you can, you, know, you can look at the factors that have contributed to that. There's not an easy fix to that and that's been really worked on at the moment. Um, and we're probably feeling it in Melbourne the most because this is the biggest car import terminal in Australia. Um, sorry, I've probably gone no, on a no, few different aspects, but it brought in a little bit of uh, a couple of the prior sessions. I, I have found that people are very interested in cars at the present time. Uh, so you can you can never go wrong with mentioning cars and a relatable consumer example of, of how these things are impacting on the economy. Uh, I want to come to you, Justin, because obviously airports were right there at the front line of COVID and the impacts, and, and we saw... The incredible impact on air freight initially and, and obviously passenger uh, transport as well. Where where are you now? And we've obviously seen big, you know, tick up in numbers in terms of passengers back at airports and travel. Um, where do you see the current level of disruption and, and where things are at now? Yeah, there's, there's a few um, aspects to that question. Um, Saul's obviously touched upon that macro piece and it's probably import, important to just recognise that um, from a disruption piece and particularly disruption around supply chains, there's, there's not just COVID, but there's also the extreme weather events, the geopolitical environment, our relationship with China um, and, and most recently Ukraine. Um, I mean, from an airport's perspective, you're right, we were at the front of that and most significant, there was the closure of borders and the cessation of, of travel. Um, there were <clears throat> periods through COVID where, you know, airline services coming into the airport were running at three and 4% of what they were pre-COVID. So, so really being whacked around. <clears throat> um, interesting low, interestingly though, from, a, um, from an air freight perspective and a freighter perspective, the number of freighters coming in really quadrupled to, to sixfold um, increase, but the total movement of freight was actually down about 40%. And that's really because freight travels on passenger aircraft. Um, and so, so that's, I guess, where you see the major impact. Where we're at today, uh, it's been, I guess, a path to recovery. Uh, domestic 
uh, borders really reopened. It was November 2021 and international borders around about February 2022, so about a year ago. Domestic very quickly got to about sort of about 80, 85% of pre-COVID levels. It's actually still around about there now, about 85 to 90% of, of pre-COVID levels. International um, is coming back quite, or I guess quite strongly, but really just over the last couple of months when China reopened. Um, so again, uh, we're at, with international around about 85 to 90%, but again, we look at the volumes of freight that's moving through the airport, that's still down about 20 to 30%. Um, so so the, the airport, I guess we are recovering, but it is a slow sort of trajectory back uh, to, to where we were sort of prior to COVID. But there are some unique aspects to that recovery, which we can probably talk about a bit later. Right. Hermione, if I could come to you on the issue of interconnected yeah. infrastructure, and we obviously saw, I think, a bit of enhanced cooperation across different areas during the pandemic and, and responding to that issue. Where are we at now and, and are we continuing to you know, really uh, recognise the importance of interconnection and being really conscious of that and, and coordinating that? Um, I, I would say uh, we, we're new to that thinking. And my view would be that um, most people, as we've all said, didn't really know that the hidden enabler even existed in 2019, supply chain, freight logistics. And now people do, which is great. And there's a lot of people with a little bit of knowledge. It's great they're interested. But to have complex systems interconnected means we have to have a lot of planning, a lot of investment. So if you look at the, I'm a bit of a pedant, if you look at the term interconnected and what it means, then you're basically looking at all constituent parts of the system are coordinated, are linked. And that infrastructure includes school systems, education systems. It includes energy. It includes, of course, the four basic modes that we require, the tools, a truck, a train, a ship, a plane. We require them. And what we really require is uh, an understanding that in terms of our geography, not just the geopolitical situation, but our geography, a tiny market, 26 million, um, a long way away from the major trade routes. At the end, an end destination port as a country in the north-south trade routes, which are the minor ones, as opposed to the real business being on the east-west trade routes. So we're a tiny market, a long way from the rest of the world. And if you remember your history in Geoffrey Blaney, the notion of the tyranny of distance, I believe that's a really important issue for us to be never forgetting. Um, and COVID and the floods and our geopolitical situation has pushed that really to the fore. So in, in my view, as a, a first degree, a geographer, if you look at our island nation, you say, okay, COVID taught us with aviation coming to close pretty much on one day in March, 2020. Um, most of our, um, our, say, high value agricultural and fishery product goes in the belly of the plane and has always been sort of, um, let's say a discount pricing because the passengers are paying the real value of the freight, of the movement. Um, we can't rely on that anymore. So high value agricultural product in 2019 is not high value agricultural product now. It's really changed the way in which businesses can afford the um, export and import costs of increasing air and increasing um, shipping costs. We don't control and can't control global shipping as a little tiny country at the backside of the earth. We can't control international aviation. We just can't, we don't. So we're an island nation. Every bit of cargo has to go out in a ship or out in a plane or in by, and we're import dominant. So we have a really serious issue here that we can't control a lot, but what we can control is what is within our border. And that's where we need to be interconnected. We need to make sure we use all the tools available to us. We're basically a trucking uh, country. Um, often government people say we're agnostic about mode. It's nonsense. We hardly have the investment in rail to have a really strong rail system. We just don't. Um, therefore, we're using trucks. We have a very serious issue that we don't have the drivers. So we have to be realistic about what we can do. And one of the things that COVID showed, in my view, during those two years of crisis, 
was the way in which government and industry association like the Australian Logistics Council and the companies in supply chain work together to make stuff happen. Is that resilient? No, that's another question. But work together so closely and realistically to address the problems. And I think that the lack of interconnected thinking in Australia is a great problem. Supply chains are complex systems and already people are forgetting how important they are. So I think we need to, it's really important to have today and it's really important we keep these messages about interconnectivity. How do we get freight out? How do we get freight in? How do we use every tool available to us to make sure our supply chains are competitive on global markets? And that's our, that's our big challenge, I think, ahead. Thanks, Hermione. And uh, I want to come to you, Jan. You've been waiting very patiently on the on the screen. Uh, always like to make sure that our virtual participants don't don't feel left out. Uh, obviously, the the part that we haven't talked so much about is the the warehousing and storage infrastructure on this. Where is that market at the moment, and and what has happened in in recent years in that market? Sure. Thanks, uh, Jared. I hope everyone can hear me well well enough. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes, good, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, I would have loved to be there in person. Uh, unfortunately, just uh, could not uh, manage to do so. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of physical space and the physical supply chain and um, you know storing and movement of goods, uh, you know, businesses in this area was totally caught unawares, as was many other parts of uh, you know uh, government and business by what happened during COVID. Initially, when we started hearing about lockdowns, we thought, well, OK, you know, nobody's going to be able to work. Uh, there won't be money. People are going to struggle. There won't be demand. And as a result, the immediate reaction uh, within companies was to basically pull back on orders and say, let's just sit out and wait. And then we all know the story of the, um, you know, uh, um, support that governments have given financially to, to their populations. And suddenly we had people sitting at home not spending money on travel and, and holidays, you know, looking for things to do, starting to buy online. And suddenly we saw this big spike in demand. And now the question was, well, where are we going to get all the stock from? At the same time, we started seeing cities in China, ports being locked down, chaos in shipping lanes. And everybody said, oh, my goodness, we have to get a lot of stock in. And the you know, classical bullwhip effect, we just saw orders go through the roof, volumes go through the roof. And everybody was getting as much stock in as possible to prepare for this demand and for further disruptions in the supply chain. And as a result, the demand for space just exploded. Um, in the uh, the last 10 years, the, the average uh, CBRE tracks, um, you know, the demand for space and the, the leasing transactions in the market. And that demand was sitting, you know, uh, at an average about two and a half million, including the last two, three years. Uh, we saw in 2021, actually, that demand going up to nearly four and a half million square meters of industrial and logistics space in Australia. Um, and that followed 2020, where it was sitting under just three and a half million. And as remember, as I say, the last 10 years was about two and a half million. So suddenly there was this demand for all the space. Now, last year, we saw that um, activity in leasing uh, coming back slightly to just over 3 million, but we believe that's actually the case because there just weren't any space available. In fact, at the moment, um, we sit on about a 0.6% vacancy rate for industrial and logistics in Australia. That is one of the lowest in the world. Um, in Sydney, for instance, it's just 0.2%. There literally is not industrial and logistics space available. At the same time, you know, the, the supply chain challenges also impacted the construction industry. So in terms of being able to keep up with the construction of space, if the developable land was available, which is another issue, you know, that started hitting some issues. And, you know, we saw some real disruptions with construction, uh, the availability and cost of materials. And as a result, you know, the, the big thing that we've seen out of this is the rent growth. After many years of fairly flat rent growth in industrial and logistics space, suddenly we had, you know, significant rent growth over the last few years. Um, in Australia last year, I believe it was across the board about 25% in certain markets like Sydney um, and Melbourne, you know, it was about 38 and 30% um, respectively. So, uh, you know, everybody was looking for space. Uh, now, at the moment, where we are, 
uh, I think with you know COVID uh, still uh, you know very much with us, but becoming the impacts that it had in 2021, 20 um, or 2020 and 2021 becoming sort of a part of a distant memory. Um, businesses are starting to look now at their inventory holdings. The the just in time that went to just in case, as Sari has said. Um, you know, it's just getting a bit more scrutiny at the moment and saying, well, you know, we are still quite heavy on inventory. Uh, we have some uh, headwinds in the economy. So how do we deal with that? And the focus on inventory cover is coming back. Uh, you know, how much it will come back? Uh, not sure. I think companies will have to be smarter about it as well. Uh, you know, and the use of technology that uh, a few people have talked about, you know, about better understanding, well, you know, how much cover do I keep for what parts of my product range uh, so that I can you know get the best value for money out of my investment and inventory are things that we're starting to see and uh, businesses right now is also just starting to question maybe some of the the growth that they've um, uh, forecasted for especially the next two years the other thing just briefly that's also driving uh, you know the demand for space and that that will become uh, a bigger factor now over the coming years is twofold one is immigration uh, so, you know, CBRE estimates that for every additional person coming into Australia, we need about 4.5 square meters of industrial and logistics space. Uh, you know, uh, I've just seen the latest estimates now is for about 650,000, you know, migrants joining us in the next two years here in Australia. You know, that's nearly 3 million square meters of additional space we need. And then uh, e-commerce. As we see e-commerce penetration continuing to grow over the uh, the next year, after admittedly pulling slightly back from the highs of COVID, uh, that will drive additional space requires, uh, requirements in the market as well. Uh, in fact, again, CBRE estimates that you know for every additional one billion dollars that uh, you know e-commerce the e-commerce market grows with, you need another seventy thousand square meters of space. And with the growth between now and 2026, that means that we'll you know, need around about one and a half million square meters of additional industrial and logistics space. So the key message is very low vacancy, one of the lowest in the world. Uh, you know, other factors now going to drive demand for space in the coming years, not so much the, uh, uh, the COVID impact. Uh, and so, you know, we think supply will stay tight. Thanks, Jan. And uh, you raise a really important point around migration and population growth, which um, we will certainly come back to if we have time. I do want to uh, go to Pigeonhole because we do have a number of questions coming up. And once again, I encourage you to keep putting those questions in because I will try to get to as many of them as possible. We've got a number of questions, I think, Hermione, that go to this issue that you've raised mm -hmm. around connectedness, collaboration and the resilience of working together uh, compared to what we've we've seen through the crisis. And I guess the questions, if I could sum them up, some are about, you know, what do you see as the inhibitors and others are about, well, how can we work better together going forward? Um, I'd like to get everyone's views on this, but, but perhaps starting with you, Amani, yeah. given that you were the one who raised the issue. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I, th I think um, we need a good, healthy dose of reality. That's my thought. And the good healthy dose of reality is in how do we create interconnectedness and how do we work together to make sure our future is as good as our past, even maybe even better, hopefully better, much better. And I think um, the how do we work together, the collaboration, as I was saying, there, there's just amazing experience that happened during COVID in every part of supply chain, whether it's aviation ports, whether it was uh, the supermarkets, whether it was whoever it was, people were working together with government, doing extraordinary things in an extraordinary time in our history. So that gives me enormous heart. Going forward, though, you know, there's the goldfish factor about people forgetting what's, what happened a little while ago and going on to the next thing. But the reality, I think, is at, at, at different levels. And one is at the, the level of... Um, Industrial land, we need industrial land. It's basic. If we don't have industrial land for logistics and supply chain activities, then that activity is going to go further out to the outer suburbs. And that means we're going to increase the costs by the numbers of trucks because we rely on them, the petrol, the fuels, the emissions, the time, all of those costs if we don't have land where we need it in terms of logistics and supply chain. And at the moment, as um, 
we, we were just hearing, there are so many issues about industrial land. So we need the basics of industrial land. I think Sydney at the moment, I think it's 2.7% is the normal uh, across the Western developed world in major cities. 2.7% is the normal vacancy rate of industrial land available. In Sydney at the moment, it's 0.3 of a percent. Australia is the worst country in the world in terms of less, least available vacancy rates of industrial land. And urban encroachment is gobbling it up. It's gobbling it up around the port. It's gobbling up it up around uh, the major freight corridors. We need to protect the freight corridors. We need to protect the system of transportation to and from our critical airports, our critical ports, and our critical businesses. So industrial land is one bit. That is, a, is one point. Urban planning is another. I won't go on too long about this, but urban planning. We need people who are educated to understand supply chain exists. We did some recent research of the 26 undergraduate and postgraduate courses across Australia in urban planning. Not one, not one had a unit that was supply chain, freight logistics, productivity, efficiency. However, those same urban planners are being educated in amenity, the enjoyment of space, that is active transport, bicycle riding and walking but nothing about the fabric of the economic activity that underpins our society, which COVID showed us. So we absolutely need to have the education of people right. We need to make sure our universities and TAFEs actually work to national capability, not just to the profit mofet of international students. We have very serious issues in our capability and our people issues, as well as, of course, investment in rail, investment in the land to protect it. So I see that we have a very poor understanding of complex systems. We lack the maturity of many countries across the world, the Western developed world and the developing nation. In ASEAN, logistics is a top priority of the government and has been for 15 years. In Southern American countries, the same. And then of course, in Europe, we know how important logistics is to the Netherlands, to Germany, to France. But Australia, we've been had a very different attitude. So we need to understand this connectivity. And the partnership working that we're working at the ALC with the governments across the country is so important to making sure we improve the awareness of the complexity and improve the awareness about how do we make these systems hum. Paul, did you want to weigh in on that one? Well, that was a very good answer, and I'm very much aligned with that. Uh, we're aligned. <laughs> I'm very much aligned with Simone on this notion of interconnectedness, but maybe I can sort of add a few things from a different angle. Um, there, there's a there's a role for all of us to to look at how we can influence and and lead the way here. Um, you know that that interconnectedness that all of us have when you look at those flow and impacts right up and down the supply chain mean that it really should be in all of our interests to have that end-to-end -end supply chain as efficient and productive as we can get it. It's very easy to just look at our own part or our own patch within that supply chain and just take a port lens or just look at uh, the airport as the gateway for air freight. But that end-to-end -end view, and it's, you know, we have self-interest everywhere. Um, I've been, before Port of Melbourne, I was at Toll uh, Group, large global logistics provider for just under five years. Before that, I was at a company called Asciano, which used to own the Patrick Ports businesses and Pacific National Rail Freight businesses. And I was there for just under a decade. Self-interest across transport and logistics and supply chain is as strong as any industry that I've uh, uh, experienced. But we all need to leave a little bit of that self-interest at the door. It's inevitable and it's understandable that we all have it. But how do we take a step back and take an end-to-end -end view on what is actually the right thing and the more efficient and productive outcome for that end-to-end -end supply chain? Where does the investment need to go so that capacity is in the right place at the right time uh, for that future? And when you look at supply chain and the infrastructure investment that needs to sit behind it, there's long lead time. So the coordination, the planning, uh, really being clear on what those future needs are uh, is an important aspect. But I'd encourage all of us to really take a bit of a role where we step back and uh, and take that sort of end-to-end -end view. Jacob, if I may, if I may just jump in there, um, I think two things that Hermione has said, you know, sort of. Um, uh, make me think about you know the importance of land supply. So not only is our vacancy uh, one of the lowest in the world, and certainly certainly is the lowest in the world by far, 
But also if you look at the amount of space that's under construction as a percentage of, you know, total um, space, industrial and logistic space, we have the lowest percentage of space in construction, under construction in the world. So not only do we have this demand and very low vacancy, we also not constructing enough space because we don't have enough land available. And then the location of that land, it is so important. Uh, 50 uh, to 75 percent of the supply chain cost of companies is in transport. So, you know, 75 percent is for your e-tailers. So, you know, people that have much smaller deliveries. But where you actually have that land in relation to your demand um, points, so where the population lives, and in relation to the major entry points, such as ports, is very important from a cost-based point of view for occupiers of industrial and logistics space. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for jumping in there. Uh, Justin, did you want to weigh in on this one? Look, I'm not sure I can add a whole lot more, but maybe I can sum up. <laughs> <laughs> Do it that way. Look, I mean, clearly population growth drives economic growth and trade, and that's a great thing. But if it's not well managed, then you just get congestion, inefficiency, and it just adds cost right throughout the supply chain. There are so many interconnected components that need to come together. So we've spoken about ports, I mean, airports, warehousing, um, clearly. There's also um, transport, you know, roads, rail, public transport. There's digital infrastructure that needs to come together, you know, whether it's Wi-Fi, 5G, data centres, and you need a skilled workforce to bring all of this together, right? Um, how do you get there? That's really the fundamental part of the question. How do you create coordination across all of this? We need to not think in short-term periods. So we can't think in five to 10 year blocks. Infrastructure and infrastructure requirements are multi-decade investments that need to occur. And you need to have a multi-decade view in terms of what, in, what supply chains are going to look like. Um, and then you need to protect for that. So that you know, is about education, it's about information sharing, it's about coordination across planning, um, that managing that encroachment, really important as well, because I mean, just as the airport, you know, we're growing um, as, a, as an organization, looking at building a, a third runway. When the airport opened 50 years ago, um, there was effectively um, nothing around us uh, a four runway master plan we're looking at building our third and lo and behold there's now residential areas um, within vicinity of the airport which creates noise issues it just creates um, it creates roadblocks that shouldn't necessarily be there if we can plan better as an as a as a state really and and as major infrastructure providers together all right pigeonhole good, running good summary yeah, and before great. the airport, Justin ran the strategy team at um, Australia Post. So it brings a good broader end-to-end -end supply chain uh, perspective on that too. Pigeonhole is running hot and we're getting, we're getting some changing votes here very quickly. And I, I do want to get through the top questions. There's a couple in here around rail, which you obviously mentioned, Hermione, about both why do, why do we struggle to make it relevant um, for government and what can be done, but also a question around inland rail and what that will do for interconnectedness. Did you want to offer any thoughts? Yeah. Probably you and you and Saul on that on that one. You go first. I'll have an easy job. <laughs> well, the Inland Rail Review is not yet with us, but we look forward to uh, understanding what that review holds. I think it's important that it's been done, um, and anything that's going to improve the. Uh, the systems that we rely on and enable us to use the tools that supply chain needs is, is valuable. Um, in terms of rail, I've worked in rail and, and parts of supply chain for a very long time. And I do find it very disappointing. And the disappointment is you can when you see rail working well here in Australia and in other countries, you go, wow, that's really cool. And we have a very strong rail um, uh, uh, rail capability east-west uh, in Australia, from Western Australia to the eastern coast. But when you look at the opportunity that has not been invested in for a long time, despite all the talk, despite the targets of 30% of freight on rail for the last 20 odd years, despite all of the talk about rail, um, it, so little has been done. And now we're in an era of needing decarbonisation and we need to shift for urgent um, reasons for our world 
we need to move to decarbonisation. And rail, of course, provides an enormously important opportunity. So does coastal shipping, real coastal shipping. So we need to have the tools that we require. And I think the great sadness for me is, and uh, in a way, you know, it's that thing about uh, political cycles mm -hmm. and what attracts investment. And unfortunately, it's the shiny objects and it's the, the things that people can see. It's not the, the education of people necessarily. It's not the rail tracks or, you know, it's, it, but it's pretty simple, you know, with rail. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not that hard. You need land, you need some rail tracks, you need some regulatory environment, you need some signaling, you need some rolling stock and you need a few drivers. You know, you, it, it's not hard and we should have invested so long ago in this important mode. Um, so I think that it's, it's part of this political cycle that we're in, that um, our country doesn't think in terms of the long-term issues that are so important and so hard to bring on quickly. I'm also very aligned with Hermione on, on rail and I'm a big believer and supporter of us needing to have a meaningful modal shift. Uh, and more freight off-road onto rail. And it's important for so many reasons. Um, I also share the disappointment. So currently, if you look at containerised freight in and out of the port gate here in Melbourne, uh, less than 7% is on rail, and that's principally regional exports. So how do we really get this uh, shift going? Um, I mean, it's still, uh, you know, we're still waiting for the inland rail report. I understand it's, it's coming soon, but that's been a debate on where, uh, you know, where intermodal, where that inland rail should end, where terminals, the interstate terminals should go on the Brisbane end and down on the Melbourne end. How do you connect into the port? A debate here in Melbourne that's been going for years on whether we have a, an intermodal freight terminal on the west or whether we have one in the north. Right. Above all else, let's just make a decision. So let's make a decision, give industry the clarity, let private investment flow uh, and the supply chains build and grow around uh, that kind of clarity. So hopefully that's coming soon, um, but we really have to, to do that. And it's important for so many reasons. It's critical for Port of Melbourne as a, as a city port, uh, just out uh, the back of where we are here today. Um, but we have to get trucks off road. It has climate benefits. I mean, one 600 metre standard train can take uh, more than uh, 80, 80, 20 foot uh, container uh, containers on it and one truck might have uh, two or three of those so you can see just the number of trucks that you can take off the road if we get rail really working ideally what you'd have you'd have an interstate terminal co-located with an IMEX an import export terminal you'd get that metro shuttle really going in terms of um, the, the freight uh, containers coming in and out of the uh, the port um, but we're a long way off that. And it means, you know, we just need the clarity of decisions. We need investment to start flowing, but it's a really important part of our future. And you can see, as Hermione said, what happens when you have got the conditions right. Now, clearly in a country which is, you know, has a land size close to um, the United States with only 26 million people, where we've shown rail really does work is that long distance um, across Australia, as Amani said. And I'm not sure what the current market share is, but it's a, it's a large part of uh, the freight and road has a, a minority share in terms of that. Very different when you look at North South and, and shorter haul rail. And it is hard to find globally examples of where short haul rail uh, can really be viable and commercial and work in the right way. But that's our challenge. It's also a challenge because of how fragmented the different parts of uh, rail is, how many different players there are, how we really make it work with that coordinated, broader end-to-end -end network approach. And if I, if I could add something to that, I think the really important thing is we look at these as systems. It's not either or. It's not the West or the North. We need both. We're a huge metropolitan area. Um, it's not freight, uh, whether the uh, governments in each jurisdiction are going to prioritise decarbonisation in the car market versus freight. We need it both. Mm. And so I think what we need is to approach things rather than either or. Uh, and uh, we need to look at these as systems and how do we build strong systems? Uh, and that's probably the big difference in our thinking. Right, we do have, again, more movement on, on Pigeonhole, which is great to see uh, in terms of votes for a question, which, which may be our last question, which I'll ask to everyone uh, if we have time. And that is, is just in time dead? And I wanted to start with you, Jan, and provoke you a little bit on this, because if we don't have the industrial space, then can we afford for just in time to be 
uh, dead. What's your view on this? Uh, I, I don't think just in time is dead. Uh, I think we will we'll go to a different um, form of just in time uh, in that we'll get more clever, as I said, one with you know the range and, and the cover that we hold for which parts of our range. Is it fast moving? How important is it? Um, what's the risk to this part of the range? You know, am I sourcing it only from China? Is that you know providing me with risk? And also getting more clever with where we source from. So you know, the China plus one that um, Joss has, has mentioned. Uh, so there's work to be done over the coming years in terms of you know uh, dealing with the risks um, and the impact of when those risks happen, uh, as we've seen during COVID. And I think over time, we will move back to just in time, but it will be in a different supply chain landscape uh, with, uh, you know, uh, more diverse sourcing, uh, using technology better in terms of understanding, you know, um, how I, uh, what parts of my range I actually have higher inventory cover on. Uh, you know, so no, I don't think just in time is dead. Uh, you know, uh, we'll just get to a, a version two of just in time uh, that will make it less risky. All right, Justin. Obviously, air freight is a lot of air freight. Yeah, just so in time. clearly, there's there's two elements to air freight. One is imports, and one is exports. And I think um, Jan sort of hit the import side of things, particularly around e-commerce um, and getting um, those to market. Um, picking up on the export side of things, and Hermione um, picked up on this earlier. Astra sorry, Victoria is very skewed to perishable goods, export of perishable goods, particularly foods um, uh, uh, and agricultural products. And there is a real cost of delays in getting that product to market. In fact, we've been um, doing a, a bit of a sounding with um, market participants just recently and speaking with one of the Tasmanian uh, fisheries, uh, noting that uh, a 24 hour delay in getting product to market um, impacts the sale price by 20%. Um, and that product has a shelf life of about two weeks. So there is a, there's a, there's a real cost, not just to, to industry, but to businesses when there are blockages in supply chain. So, um, so no, I mean, just in time's not dead, uh, but businesses do need to be aware where there is constraints um, what, how that changes the markets they're actually uh, selling to um, and procuring from. Amon? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And for me, it's probably, again, it's not either or, we need both. If you've got highly perishable product, it's just in case it's not going to work. And uh, if you look at, as is a food, uh, a major, if you look at um, food exports and agricultural exports is a really important part of our economy, then you say, well, we produce enough for 70 million people to consume. We're 26 million. What are we going to do with the rest? We need to have sort of complex thinking or thinking about value add and innovation and what we're going to do to the rest of the product. How are we going to deal with that? And so I think this just in case, just in time, it depends. Supply chains are complex, depending on the cargo, depending on the realities of the circumstances. So it's, it's not an either or. Last word for you. I, I'd, I'd agree with those comments too. I think, um, yeah, Justin's point around the awareness is a key one. So being, you know, uh, aware of what supply chains you're relying on, where the vulnerabilities are, where the constraints are, um, and how you ensure that you've got the right diversity in those supply chains, the resilience being built up. So, that, you know, that will clearly continue because there will always be continuing uh, impacts. And we've talked about a number today, and I'm sure there's a number in the future that we probably haven't yet fully experienced or really even uh, thought of. Um, uh, I won't open up the prior discussion where they, we talked about geopolitical risks, but that is a, a watch. I mean, if we just take uh, the Port of Melbourne as a snapshot, uh, it's the largest container port and general cargo port in Australia, uh, just out here uh, behind us. Uh, more than a third of the nation's trade is in and out of the Port of Melbourne. Um, 40% of containerized imports, more than 40% comes from China. The next major country uh, that we import from is the USA, which is just below 8%. Then you've got New Zealand and a number of other Asian countries in that top 10, but it drops away pretty quick. So you can just see uh, the importance of that trading relationship. And if there are any kind of 
uh, impacts to that. You know, examples we've seen in the last couple of years when sanctions were put on things like timber and barley and wine that overnight uh, changes uh, the uh, the supply chains and the uh, the trade uh, for those type of uh, companies. So um, yeah, it's, it's really around the awareness piece and that focus. Um, as a bit of a lead indicator in terms of you know economic outlook, you know clearly there's also uncertain times that we're all aware of. We've seen in the last four months uh, container import and full in, full containerized import is probably the best lead indicator we have for economic activity in terms of just a, a gauge on, on on what's coming in uh, as an uh, as an import destination um, island here in Australia. Um, and four months in a row where we've had trade volumes down on last year, February around Australia uh, was really materially down and a number of overseas ports were also down year on year when you look at uh, February numbers. March looks like it's picked up um, a little bit and the first three weeks are okay, but still uh, behind on, on last year's number. So that's just a, a watch out for the future. What we did see, I think, in, in, in February, was a big element of destocking and running down inventory levels, which relates back to your question of just in time and just in case um, uh, with that change sort of economic outlook and some of the uncertainty ahead. Thanks all. We have come to uh, time and I know that Hermione talked about a, a good, you know, healthy dose of reality, but perhaps if I could say if the interconnection between our panel members is any guide, I'm a, I'm a little bit more optimistic about our ability to get greater interconnectedness We're in, our, friends in our supply yeah, yeah. chains. <laughs> um, so, and thank you very much for the questions in Pigeonhole, which were uh, excellent and great voting activity, always good to see. Um, but if you could join with me in, in thanking our panellists. Uh, we are now we are now going to networking lunch back outside and then we'll be back uh, here at 2.05 p.m. sharp. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us back following lunch, which went very, very quickly. Um, I hope all of you had um, conversations as interesting uh, as the ones I found myself in. Uh, it, was, it was a fantastic opportunity to catch up with, with a few of you. Um, I am really uh, looking forward to the, the next 20 minutes. It is going to be rapid fire. Um, joining me on stage is uh, Donna Looney, who is the Head of Division for Sovereign Capability and Supply Chains, Department of Industry Science and Resources. And if we thought that the whole supply chain sort of issue was sort of buried and whatever else, um, I'm guessing that, um, that Donna's felt like um, a decade or, or more of working in this field has all of a sudden hit the limelight. Um, and really uh, rocketed up the, the league ladder of important policy issues uh, and conversations, not just in, in Canberra, but uh, around the country. Um, I'm sure many of you are gonna have questions for Donna as well. So um, jump into, into the app again, because we've got 20 minutes, it's probably easier for me to sort of just navigate that and plus you can vote on interesting questions and we'll make sure that we, um, we get to those. Um, so Donna. 10 years or more in and out of this, where do you think supply chains are at in this country at the moment? Um, so look, I think that there's been a really interesting discussion this morning around where supply chains are at now. Um, so I head up uh, a group uh, that's in my division that most of you probably will have heard of, which is the Office of Supply Chain Resilience. Um, and it was stood up in the during the pandemic when we were looking at um, supply chains uh, in that context. And I think that the discussions we've had today about supply chains um, and where they're at in the current sort of economic geopolitical situation um, shows that um, it wasn't just the pandemic that um, we, we've been looking at with supply chains, but as Josh Meltzer even mentioned this morning, um, we're looking at it now from that trade and economic impact as well and seeing things that we haven't seen before. So I think that, um, to go to your question, I think that some of the issues that we saw during COVID, um, which led to the, the standing up of, as we call it, OSCAR, um, were really based around the pandemic, but uh, we've been really um, shifting the way we work through the transition to some of the other challenges that we've seen around supply chains, uh, including, as been, has been mentioned earlier, um, uh, the war in, in Ukraine, um, particularly uh, domestically uh, large weather events and those types of things. 
Um, and we, the conversations that started for us mainly around um, delivering on a productivity commission report that spoke around, that spoke about um, supply chain, chain challenges. We delivered on um, the, the, the recommendations that were in the supply chain, the PC supply chain report, but from there it's grown and it's mm. changed. So I'd like to say, you know, we, we, and as the conversation has happened this morning, we are all far more aware of the importance of our supply chains to everyday needs. And I think that that goes to everyday Australians um, who probably hadn't paid much attention to supply chains, but do now when it, it, it impacts the, the, the price on the, the grocery shelf and those types of things. Um, and so some of our conversations around supply chains have gone from, um, where we recognise that Australia um, has uh, maintained its resilience through the recent period that, of course, has been really significant challenges, but we've managed to, to sort of group up different fora to be able to address some of those challenges. Um, but I think that the things we're seeing now when I'm talking through the supply chain um, roundtable that we hold with industry, we're seeing... Um, that the uh, that it's the whole supply chain we're looking at now. It's not just a particular, you know, manufacturing of a good or product. Um, and the sorts of conversations that that were had in the last session around um, the fact that we are having trouble with uh, jobs and skills, getting trained um, warehousing staff, getting enough drivers for trucks, and those sorts of things is really where we're moving to now when we're looking at how robust and resilient our supply chains are. So I think that that, that the, the developments over the last couple of years have meant, yes, we're paying more uh, attention to supply chains now, but it's really shifted from where it was to a more complex understanding of supply chains um, and the impact that it has uh, throughout the economy. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we were talking at our table about how uh, the pandemic Sort of did two things. I mean, on the one hand, it, it made us acutely aware of how connected to the rest of the world um, we are and how dependent on those relationships and supply chain, chains we are. But it also um, really isolated us. Um, and in some ways, we, we felt we benefited from that isolation and, of course, has raised this whole question around, um, you know, resilience and sovereign capability. Um, uh, for someone who's been an economist for a long time, this sort of sounds a little bit like industry policy. Um, which used to be a bad word, but now we've got the National Reconstruction Fund. So um, do you mind just telling us a little bit about the, the, the fund's focus, its priorities, and how the role that it's going to play in building mm. sovereign capability and sort of helping us sort of be, become more resilient in supply chain? Yeah, sure. Um, so you probably, most of you are aware that the legislation for the National Resilience Fund um, passed through the Senate uh, last week and is uh, now waiting royal assent to, to become, um, to be implemented. But the team that works on the NRF are doing a lot of work around what that will look like. So there are um, around seven national priorities and you'll have to excuse me while I just list them because I don't have them all on the top of my head. So there's medical manufacturing, transport, which is really important, goes to the discussions that we've just been having today. Um, value adding resources and in agriculture, fishery and, and forestry, um, defence capability and enabling technologies. And there's a billion um, mark put set aside for critical technologies and a billion for advanced manufacturing. And overall, um, 8 billion of the NRF has been earmarked for particular purposes and there's seven that will be available for the NRF uh, board to be able to decide how they will invest that along with um, in line with the, the government's investment mandate. So really, I think the, the shift with this approach to industry policy um, is to step away from the large focus on grants um, that we've seen in previous times. And it's really looking at the high value add areas of the economy um, and it's investing through targeted investments um, such as um, uh, loans, equity and, uh, and guarantees. And so I think that some of the things we have heard from industry is that having a grant is fantastic, 
but sometimes having the government invest in your project is actually more powerful for getting additional um, investment from other, other areas and those types of things. So government, I think, has been listening to this. Um, and while grants will have a place going forward, it's really this investment in um, transformative industries that I think will make a big difference um, to how we're looking at building um, sovereign capability. And I know we use sovereign capability in a lot of different ways at the moment, but um, it will go a long way to making sure that where we see there are, where, where the government, and I should say the board, because there'll be an independent NRF board making these decisions, um, that they, they're really looking at the future. Uh, I heard someone earlier talking about the short time time frames for consideration of things given, particularly given um, political cycles. Um, this will, this new approach um, through the NRF will be looking further ahead than just the political cycle to make those investments um, that may come to fruition on a longer time frame that you would normally see through a grant program or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at um, not just what's happening around the world now um, and the step up in the sort of investments and the co-investments that we're seeing, and we've already mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, but but around the world, everyone's doing this. I think it is good to see that Australia is paying attention, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, but also, if you look at, for you know, the US as an example, this approach to co-investment and government investment and yeah. and sticking with projects rather than a sort of one and done grant is definitely um, where progress and better outcomes have been achieved. Um, but it's going to be interesting to, uh, I think it's going to be important and interesting to see how, uh, you know, the department and the government communicate the success of of the yeah, fund absolutely. Um, and the and the board I think will have an important role to, to play um, hasn't looking for royal assent on the legislation any timing on the appointment of the board or the announcement of the board uh, so the board is expected to be operational mid-year um, we don't have any specific dates but there's a lot of work going on there to both establish so the, there will be a national resilience fund agency uh, and a board, and there's a lot of work happening at the moment for that, all expected to be stood up mid-year, and that will just depend on um, the passage of all of those types of um, approvals and things. I've got to ask you this first question. I think I've answered the one about the board already, so we've got line of sight to that question. There is a question here, which is, I'm, I'm going to ask the first question so you, you can stop voting. <laughs> um, $15 billion, how does this have a meaningful impact? Uh, it sounds like half a single tunnel build on the east coast. Yeah. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. So um, the government will develop an investment mandate. And at the moment, the department are working to um, develop co-investment plans. And I know that you, you mentioned that that's the type of approach that we would see um, rolling out in the US and other places at the moment. Um, I think that the co-investment plans will be able to, um, to prioritise where it is that that money is going. So it won't be um, a, a prize for everyone who applies for the NRF um, and it will be really targeted. But I think that what you talked about in terms of um, the Inflation Reduction Act and then we've seen the CHIPS Act and those types of things in the US, a big focus will be on where do we fit into the global value chain, I think. Um, and how it is that by making these investments using that $15 billion, that will help to leverage other investment coming in uh, and where we play a part in terms of those global um, value added uh, supply chains. I think the other thing that's sort of become a bit more apparent to me and um, Don and I were talking uh, over lunch about the number of inquiries going on and there's certainly a lot going on at the moment, but one of them that I was involved with recently was looking at the national science priorities. So I think one of the things that's interesting to sort of take into account or, or reflect on is, yes, we've got the fund, but there is a whole bunch of other complementary work going on around um, reinvigorating science priorities, for instance, and therefore investments in that space that are very much aligned with the priorities that you spoke to yeah. um, with the fund as well. So it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how these things hopefully um, knit together. But you've talked about strategic priorities and, yeah. and what's going on internationally. Josh obviously um, really focused on this and his comments. I mean, I was really struck by Josh's comments about how it's just geopolitical, strategic China focus that he's giving, he was giving us out of the US. 
it was a moment for me to sort of think, oh, this is, you know, we've really got to be thinking about this. Not that we're not, but, yeah. you know, how does Australia sit in, in that space? How do we make opportunities there? And I guess there's a, maybe a message for, for business too, who sometimes have um, watched these, these international trade deals happen and not necessarily sort of felt that they were influencing them, but yeah. this seems pretty important. Yeah. So, um, so I might just start off um, by mentioning if, if I could get in a call to action today to the people who are here, um, it would be to ask people to get in touch with us and let us know where you're seeing supply chain disruptions or some vulnerability or something just a little out of the ordinary happening so that we can be on top of that domestically and globally. Um, and the other thing is for, for industry to be, and it sounds from every conversation we have and from um, from the discussion this morning, um, for industry to be really looking at their supply chains because we think that it's, it's really industry that can, um, that has the best um, response mechanism to build resilience in their supply chains and those sorts of things. A big part of what we do is share information. So uh, internationally, we, uh, we are quite engaged both bilaterally with different countries, but also um, on the supply chain front, there's a lot of um, work happening through the Indo-Pacific Economic um, Cooperation piece, so IPEF. Uh, and that's working with the US as well, where we are delivering pillar two under IPEF is around supply chain resilience. And we expect that that'll be one of the first things announced under that, that particular um, uh, initiative. And that does go to what Josh was talking about today around um, diversifying uh, who it is that we're working with and how we're building resilient supply chains across the region. Um, so that's likely to be an announcement um, very early on in the piece as one of the deliver deliverables for IPEF. Um, one of the other things we're working on at the moment is working with the UK. Um, so they were really interested in um, the model that we have in OSCA for how we um, how we identify vulnerable and critical supply chains. Uh, and we did some work with them early on in the piece in designing OSCAR. Um, and so we banded together with the UK and we're um, delivering modules uh, across the Asia Pacific that help other um, countries who might not be as sophisticated in how we're looking at supply chains as, as Australia or the UK and some of the bigger players, how we can build capability in the region so that when, um, when it is that there, there might be a crisis in the future, um, then we can look at how it is that we are all operating from a similar model. We're all looking at how it is that we would classify critical and vulnerable supply chains. And we're all, um, and we bolster the capability um, of our neighbours in the region so that we can have um, a, a better sort of approach and network when it is that we are confronted with a, a crisis or a disruption. Um, and the other thing I'll just mention is, you know, all of the other four that are happening at the moment, AUKUS, Quad, all of those things, they really go to help build um, the domestic industrial base, but also build how we, it is that we're working mm -hmm. in with gl our global supply chains with um, with our, our trusted partners. I know I heard that uh, used earlier this morning as well, but how it is that we work with our trusted partners and um, make sure that we've got we've built that resilience into what we're doing every day rather than only um, looking at it when we do have a crisis so it becomes sort of uh, first principles really about how it is that we're working on those types of things yeah I mean because it's obviously sovereign capability has some role to play but thinking about resilience isn't about building it and, and you know producing everything yourself exactly. but how you work across a, yeah. a network um, top of the pops um, I knew there had been a lot of interest in the NRF. Um, it's taken a long time to build supply chains. Realistically, how long until we start seeing the impact of the NRF? Um, so I think that that's uh, not easy for me to address today. I think um, it will depend on where everything um, is, is lands in terms of implementation. So the government, as I mentioned, will... Um, will pull together a, a, a investment mandate and the board will, the NRF board will have a look at that investment mandate. And I think that will provide the basis for um, 
the terms of, you know, the types of investments, the length of investment. But the thing I will say is that everything that will be invested under the NRF will be expected to provide a commercial return. And I think that that's the interesting piece. Um, and so it will depend on um, at what stage um, the project is at, if it's if um, the, the NRF board to choose to invest in it. Um, they'll have to take that in, into consideration because the model is around it sort of, um, you know, if the projects can make a commercial return, then that money can be reinvested into future projects as well. So that will all be determined through, um, through those mechanisms and through the co-investment plans. And our department is um, working through industry groups at the moment to identify what's realistic um, about how long it will take to to get to a commercial return uh, and those types of things. So that's all, it's all being considered. Uh, it's all very much front of mind, mm -hmm. um, but all still to work through now that the legislation has passed through, through Parliament. And we've got a very short bit of time left, but I will ask this question as well, still on the NRF. The question is how, how will it operate with the states? How are the states going to be engaged in the priorities and the investment decisions? So, um, there's been a lot of conversations with the states um, and really productive conversations. Um, and so I don't think there's, there's necessarily um, formal agreement on how that will work, but the sorts of conversations we've been having are around where states may have invested early in a project. Um, and so they may have a pipeline of projects that could be ready to go to the NRF um, that they've already invested in or that they've identified um, as appropriate for the NRF. So I think that the role of the states um, will be really around identifying and bringing um, projects to the attention of the board and, and of the, the, uh, the agency itself so that um, there's an awareness of where some technology or, um, or processes are at in their life cycle um, and where it is that they could then um, sort of um, pass through that pipeline that, that might be the state and territory pipeline into a national pipeline. Mm. Well, I knew, uh, as Jared said, and I've said previously, these conversations go like that when we're up here, but thank you so much. It's been um, super helpful, I think, and, and based on the questions, the audience very engaged. So th join me in thanking Donna. Um, at, at the risk of, um, I'm not going to say verbling, I think one of the things we saw through COVID, uh, I think was a great example of um, what we do in a crisis is, is business and government working well together. And Donna talked a bit about that as well. But uh, we also heard her say, if you've got any insights, um, if you're seeing things, the, the department is very interested in, in hearing that. And I think we shouldn't let the experience of COVID be lost. And if we're going to maintain that collaboration, it it's a two-way street. And so I guess the challenge to each of you is, is to you know, take up the offer to be involved in the conversations and to provide the information uh, to Donna and her team to help inform the decisions that they're making and the policy that's going to come from the department. Um, uh, it's the Jared and Melinda tag team today. So it is now my uh, pleasure to bring Jared back onto the stage to introduce the next session. Thank you. Thanks, Melinda. Well, we started off the day with a very global macro picture and we've moved through and had uh, a discussion around the enabling role of interconnected uh, infrastructure. And also we've obviously just had the discussion around domestic capability. So what's next? Well, we're gonna move on to the enabling role of digital transformation in supply chains. And we've got an excellent panel uh, to discuss this today. We have Kevin Gunn, uh, the Executive General Manager, Operations, Strategy and Transformation from Coles. Uh, Sari McKay, who we've all met, Managing Director at Accenture. Uh, ben Newton, who's General Manager of Strategy, Development and Partnerships at Primary Connect, part of Woolworths Group. Uh, and joining us virtually from Canberra, we're going to have Hamish Hansford, Acting Deputy Secretary, Strategic Initiatives, Department of Home Affairs. If I could get our panelists to come up and please make them welcome. Sorry, I'm a little up. So I think everyone is very uh, au fait with using pigeonhole now, which is excellent. Uh, Melinda said that this 2.30 session would be the hardest one when lunch was settling in people's bellies. And so I want 
to prove her wrong that um, we get get some really great questions and uh, interaction on on pigeonhole with this fantastic panel. Um, I want to start obviously digitization and the disruption that we've seen it, the business case for it has in some respects become stronger but at the same time when the rubber hits the road and implementing digitization is is perhaps uh, a different a different story and not just a case of one concept digitization it's lots of little things that have to come together so I thought it would be good to start with Kevin and Ben in terms of the journey that you've had uh, so far on this and, and sort of the, the, the reality uh, as well as the benefits of, of digitizing uh, supply chains. So perhaps start with you, Kevin. Great, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the invite of the chance to join you today. I think our journey on, on digitization has been one of a number of years, but I do think the last few years have accelerated some of the benefits cases and I guess some of the learning of how we do that. And I guess, if, you know, if I think about of what's the drivers of that, I, I think about that kind of in four ways. I think we've seen the, uh, the increase in computing power. We've seen the enhancements in software. We've got the connectivity now of what you can access and data in abundance. I think we were already started on that journey, but some of the events of the last few years have helped accelerate that, whether it's COVID, whether that's been uh, our supply chain disruption, and I know that's been a, a topic that I've missed earlier on today, so disappointed I missed the subject, but I know how important that is and how impactful that's been. And, and I think that's allowed us to continue with that. And it, it's always a balance. The transformation that you want to undertake, of course, is big and bold, whether that's automated distribution centers, whether that's our partnership with Ocado, whether that's the work we've been doing on uh, I guess, uh, rethinking our produce end-to-end -end model from an integrated replenishment. The balance is always the disruption that you need to go through as you do that and managing both what I think about as business as usual on one hand and transformation on the other. You've got to do both at once and do them both well. It's an unfortunate reality of commercial life, isn't it? Uh, ben, do you want to chime in on this one? Yeah, thanks, Jared. And I, I think, you know, Coles and Woolies are probably on a very similar trajectory on a lot of this stuff. Um, both of us have been on multi-year journeys. And the way I think about a lot of this is, you know, th these are investments that have been happening over multiple years. And if you think about the foundational systems, so what are the operating systems? You've got warehouse systems, you've got transport systems, you've got order management, you've got forecasting. These are just really hard systems to change. Like the actual change, uh, the change management and the change effectiveness to get, get these systems in, get them productive is really hard. But that, that's kind of the foundation. And that, that's a lot of the work that's going in at the moment. But I, I think where it then goes is to, yeah, and what, what, we're, what we're really starting to drive now is how, how do you start to connect partners up and down the supply chain? So well, well and good to sort of start optimising within your four walls, but how do, you, how do you work with your carrier partners? How do you work with your suppliers? How do you start to take a more of an end-to-end -end view? And, and I think where that ultimately leads us, and this is sort of the journey we're all on, is, is how do you get control of the data so you can start to actually orchestrate the supply chain? So make really intelligent decisions, bring in more advanced analytics and, and actually start to make better decisions together to get better outcomes. And, and you know, we'll probably get back to the just in time, just in case, but I, I think it, it actually flows over into some of that discussion as well. Uh, and Kevin touched on it. The, the other one I think for us that would be remiss not to think of as part of the business case on this journey for digitization is the introduction of more automation. Um, you think about these automated warehouses, they are effectively digital systems. And the, the, the quality of data, the amount of data that goes in is quite phenomenal. Um, but I think what a lot of people don't appreciate on those systems is they're not just about automating manual process, they're about changing the flow of goods and changing the nature of the work. So for those, those systems, and I'm sure it'd be the same for Coles, each system knows the exact layout of every store it services. So rather than just picking product and sending it out, they are sending out pallets um, basically, yeah, specifically picked by store, sequence product. So you're grouping as many pallets or many products as you can on the one pallet to drive that efficiency into your store teams. So we're actually making the, the store's lives easier, but we're actually, we're also making the, the work in the supply chain a lot easier by removing a lot of that really heavy manual work, which, which then gives you the, the other benefit of being able to get a much more diverse workforce coming in. So there, there's a lot of different parts of this journey of digitization, but, uh, but that's just a couple. Thanks, Ben. And Sari, I want to come to you on a, a broader perspective from the clients that you work with. 
how are you seeing this business case uh, for digitization playing out? Well, we, we heard from the uh, forefront of, of retailers in Australia, I guess, from uh, Ben and Kevin on, on acceleration on digital transformation. So, in fact, we are hearing that um, like over the last three years that actually there has been an increased update of supply chain digitization across different sectors, in fact, not only retail. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you think about the opening statement where I said about resilience 1.0, and I'm just gonna expand in the business case, the resi resilience 1.0 was about thinking through the lens of more inventory, increase your capacity, think about even onshoring to actually make sure that you are able to service your clients. Now the resilience 2.0 is that you think through the digital in a data enabled end-to-end -end value chain view. And if you go back to the equation, what's the future? We said cost plus service. To even to have a foundational ability to manage your costs as well as meet your increased changes in service levels from your end consumer. In retailer context, you have online channels. You have uh, you have to have the product in online um, availability as well as in store. That itself uh, creates service issues without data, without ability to actually predict it, predict your and have a better ability to forecast that demand mm -hmm. and execute those channels, it becomes very costly. So therefore the business case by itself, I think thinking through the lens of uh, cost service plus resilience uh, manage disruptions better as well as uh, sustainability, which itself is something that is a challenge for future supply chains to be able to track accurately your direct emissions, but also move into scope three emissions and how you're going to uh, start uh, collecting data for your scope three emissions. If I want to expand this further, Accenture uh, does every two years a, uh, a research on thousand companies globally. And in fact, um, the companies um, before, during and after a pandemic, uh, which have been investing about 3.9% of um, their annual sales and the digital capability, in fact, have been the leaders in this space. And there's some, I'm going to touch the base a little bit later about those actual benefits, but it's surprising though that those leaders, how they behave is in that they, uh, the leaders within those businesses, C-level is aligned to their future vision about what the technology um, view look like. There is less silo, so they collaborate across internally, but then coming back to your suppliers, like Ben mentioned about uh, in primary connect as, as well as uh, their, their customers, uh, if it's a business to a business type of transaction. Also what's different to them is they think data differently. So they think about my data, your data, our data, EA, there's an access and open platform to share your data, which comes with its own challenges, of course, but it's important to acknowledge that the thinking is the collaboration. Uh, Harmony mentioned about interconnectivity. Imagine if we would be able to, through data, connect the shipping ports, rail or trucks all the way to the actual or, 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 or coalsies, warehouses. So there is future benefits to be had, but I think that's something that um, it's yet to be seen in Australia. Sorry, you, you raise a really important point there around, you know, future potentially unexpected benefits of things that are enabled uh, in the long term from some of these changes. Um, Hamish, don't want to leave you lonely there too long on the screen. So do want to come to you with, with this question as we start to talk about some of these um, perhaps less expected benefits. I mean, what do you see as the benefits for organisations from digitising supply chains from, from your perspective? Well, thanks very much. And uh, apologies, I'm not there in person. I was actually at the Digital and Data Ministers meeting in, in Canberra. So uh, on theme and probably not a, a good opportunity to miss that. But I, I really uh, think that one of the big opportunities is to have a discussion and to have a discussion from a, a multi uh, perspective. So actually, when we think about digitization, think about actually creating new products and services, we inherently think about cost first of all, which drives business decision and in government is driving government decisions. We talk about process and how we can simplify process in, in what often becomes a replacement, but actually when you digitize, the simpler it is, the, the more cost effective it is. We think about customer experience and increasingly we're thinking about 
How do we create security outcomes? How do we think about privacy? How do we actually engage with the customer more effectively? How do we think about resilience? And how do we then bring it all together in a narrative? So at, at least at a government perspective, I think we're, we're driving digitization, but actually driving a discussion, bringing people together to try and, and look at a whole range of different problems. And I think digitization forces that discussion principally uh, around the cost investment All right, so I guess it's interesting to ask Kevin and Ben this question as well around anything that that I guess has surprised you on the way through from the the, the benefit side, and, and maybe it's not an immediate commercial benefit, but something that it's unlocked um, in terms of future capability. Kevin, I could start with you. Yeah, I think uh, I think we've got a number of examples, but if I think of one quite specific, we started on a journey about three and a half years ago to. Uh, change the way we forecasted products. So most retailers pro forecast product at a store SKU level granular and then boil that up into order plans for suppliers, use that across your network, the flow of goods. We've been on a journey looking for a, a more advanced, we, we used RDF like many people in the industry had served us really well. And we've been doing integrated replenishment probably for about 15 years. And I think, uh, we, we got involved with our own advanced analytics team. We did a, a bake off against what was out there in the industry and ended up building something ourselves in house. But that started as an investment to improve forecasting. And the, you know, part of being a, a food retailer is fresh foods are much more difficult to forecast and too little you disappoint customers lose sales too much. You create waste and uh, all that goes with it. But as we went on that journey, not only have we realized what we, we believed was always there is improved forecasting. And forecasting is the starting point, I think, in the end-to-end -end supply chain. The better you are at it, the better your end result will be. It's the law of maths rather than anything else. But what we've been able to do is then use that forecast wider. We now use that forecast for our labor planning in stores because those store skew items, that accuracy equals the sales through the register, equals the number of people we need to do replenishment. We're also using that across our business now for trade planning. We've given the teams the capability to understand how you can use that in different ways. And one of my favorite examples of it was during COVID. We had a situation during COVID where very quickly we had to uh, be able to control the number of people in our stores. We literally, across three days, had legislation put in place where we needed to be confident that we didn't breach capacity rules, but we needed to keep our stores open and keep feeding all Australians. We were able to use the same model because it was store SKU specific in 15 minute increments to actually plan out how many people, when we would have pinch points and need to intervene and actually be able to keep all of our team members and our customers safe as during it. And I know that this investment we've made in the forecast, there'll be a whole, there'll be a whole school of, uh, of cases that will come from it. But I think it's one of those things about starting a journey, knowing that you maybe know 80% of the answer, but backing yourself that you know that will be an opportunity to build incrementally on that. And our Cole's best example is integrated replenishment. When we made those major changes all those years ago, we never realized how far that would take us, whether that's availability, flow of stock, controlling working capital, having fresher foods for our customers, and of course, commercial outcomes. But I think it's just a, a great example. And I see the same in our investments in automation, to Ben's earlier point. There's a whole host of benefits that will come from that, some of which we haven't considered yet, but that's the really exciting part. Ben? Yeah, not that we want to double up, but um, yeah, look, what, what I was going to say is I think the more you digitize, then the more data you get, which is pretty obvious. But then I think how you start to col like collect that, how you start to link up that information across different operational domains, that, that then starts to unlock some very different advanced analytics. And, and I think so some of the power of where we're seeing it, and if I go probably a little bit sort of off the planning, but more sort of down the operational path, is some really great examples of where you start to pull out data and we're looking at you know really really granular sort of information that would drive sort of around it sounds very simple but things like pick paths and how long do you walk in a dc and you know on the volumes that we move depending on sort of where you lay out those products 
and you're trying to solve something that's actually very difficult and it sort of changes very regularly so you've got different seasonality moving in you've got product velocity but you've also got to think about well where, where do i put heavies where do i put lights um you know what what's the right frequency for all of these products to be going out like the, the more you get into this the more different variables you can start to unpick but as an example, that that's something that once you get that data together, you then start to overlay your advanced analytics. There, there's a multitude of those types of uh, types of problems and types of opportunity you can you can start to uncover. One one of the other ones I was going to throw out probably a little bit more trivial, um, but part of the journey we've been on is also around lifting up some of the visibility of just movements through the supply chain, particularly truck movements. And you know, I, I recall one. So we've been working on that for a while, but. Um, for a lot of those in the room, you'll remember your Melbourne lockdowns. One, one of the challenges we then in, in, um, encountered was the fact that the truck driver couldn't get out of the truck at the store. So because you're actually having that physical separation of truck driver and store people. So what we started using very quickly over a matter of days was actually starting to notify stores, getting that, those notifications coming up on store handhelds to actually get the stores ready to make sure that actually they were ready and waiting for the truck to appear. Uh, so when that person got there, they did, they then didn't have to get out. Now that that gave us another level of um, efficiency, and it, we could just start to standardise rather than having to figure out you know which truck driver's got which phone, you know has he got a number for the store, who's the person in the store. Like there, there was too much going on, so actually to start coordinating back docks, drivers, and others. So as a fairly trivial example, but it, it's another one that just sort of uncovers once once you've got that data, you've got that visibility, you've got different choice points you can start to make. Great, thanks, Ben. We're seeing some good activity here on Pigeonhole. Please, oh. very pleasing to see. Uh, and so, I want to start going to the questions here. And we do. We've got a couple of questions. I'm going to come to you first, Hamish, and then Sari. There's a couple of questions, essentially around um, data security risk, cyber risk, uh, and and how you uh, mitigate against these things. Hamish, perhaps if I could start from the the macro level and government policy level where do you see the government policy priorities here in terms of even in terms of things like data standards and uh cyber legislation where's the focus uh at the present time sure so um minister o'neill as minister for cyber security um our first cabinet level cyber security minister has outlined the government's policy position pretty clearly and that's to be the most cyber security secure country in the world by 2030 and we're in the middle of, of at the moment of building out our cybersecurity strategy 2023 to 2030. And it comes on the back of um, some pretty dedicated work over the last couple of years that I've led on critical infrastructure security. How do we actually start to build out and um, secure Australia's infrastructure, including from a cybersecurity perspective, lifting um, each of our infrastructure assets to try and meet um, a cyber standard by next year. Um, and then looking at personnel, physical and supply chain security issues to try and actually focus on a strong infrastructure backbone to the country. The cybersecurity strategy then tries to take the problem forward and say, well, what does the economy more generally need? Um, how do we start to look at um, things like supply chain in a much more holistic way? So from government's perspective, we see many com companies across the country each doing duplicative activities about supply chain security and supply chain resilience. How do we actually make a market intervention from the government perspective to try and say, what does good look like in supply chains? Is there a legitimate role for the government to regulate? Is, is there a need for something like a Cyber Security Act to set the standards to bring a greater, um, greater commonality and a greater level playing field. They're all the questions that we're exploring at the moment in the cybersecurity strategy and, and issues that the government's particularly interested in hearing from uh, people about. Um, consultation uh, paper is out at the moment, open till the 15th of April. But I think at, at its core, we've, we've done a lot of work on infrastructure. The bigger question about the economy and particularly that duplicative effort that we see occurring across so many different companies, how do we start to actually create a much more prosperous economy where we remove that duplication and should the government intervene? That's really the, the area of both previous policy but current policy thinking. And sorry, how are you seeing this play out with with your clients in terms of how they are thinking about some of these security and data challenges um, as they look at the business case for, for digitization. Yeah, so if you think about the natural, uh, I guess, consequence of uh, sharing data against called the ecosystem partners, if you think about the future supply chains, being your suppliers or consumers or your stakeholders, 
um, it's actually a natural emergent issue that comes about. And I think all of the privacy side, but access to data is a potential problem. Um, so the minimum standard is we need industry standards, right? And so, so then there needs to be a clear rules, uh, set of rules to manage this issue potentially. And I, I, I guess um, if you're looking at businesses, they have different levels of standards as well as um, if you where the, I guess, have a regulation. I think I, I just read an AFR article this morning about AI and this call out for standards as an example and regulatory um, um, how say legislation to actually manage how we are looking at artificial in, intelligence going forward. It is the same as with cyber access to data as well as they're sharing the data. Um, there are many organizations that think that they're following the standards and they say they are following, that was an AFR article, but the actions may not be there. So therefore that calls out for a regulatory uh, engagement and clear set of rules that industry needs to comply with. It's currently, it's, I guess, done in individual um, uh, participant basis, but but I think it comes back to call out for a, a, a government like Amos's organization to set those standards as well as then companies following those standards. Um, yeah. So that's a good segue into the question that has become the top question in pigeonhole. It's been moving around quite uh, dynamically. Uh, there's a question here as industry leaders, if you could challenge government to invest or change legislation in one area to drive improved supply chain resilience, what would that be? Um, and perhaps, sorry, without verbaling you, I think you're talking about standards and and sort of getting greater consistency and and leadership there is that would you would that be your top one do you think um sorry what was the, the question the question was around what the number one thing that government could do in terms of the regulatory or or investment space um on supply yeah. chains so we just heard about the seven key areas of uh seven eight billion dollars of investment from office of national um, supply chain commissioner which i'm so excited as a 20 year supply chain practitioner to have in australia fantastic so if i'm looking at that investment bucket and there's one of the key investment buckets was one billion dollars to ma um, advance manufacturing ea building our capability locally here to have that just in case capability if we need that uh, if we have further uh, geopolitical issues, as an example, we do not know what future holds. And then secondly, if I'm looking at the resilience part, again, the technology investment is so important in this country without actually improving further data uh, visibility end to end and not having that access to data and building those foundational capabilities and data and digital capabilities in Australia. Uh, and that interconnectivity we spoke about, if we are having investment to foundational capability uplift across different sectors, um, and particularly coming back to infrastructure um, investment to that, uh, I think those would be the two, actually, I extended my uh, my welcome, <laughs> so two, two key areas. So I think those two elements uh, there are the $2 billion um, would yep. be the, the wish list number yep. one and two. Thank okay. you. Kevin, sorry, he's given you permission to have more than once. <laughs> so, 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 so I'll take that up. Sure. Um, ours would be infrastructure. If I think about supply chain disruption, you know, we we operate in Australia where uh, rail is the main infrastructure that joins all of our capital cities. You know, and I think we've seen over the past few years, but especially the last 18 months, the impact. And, you know, we're just living through far north Queensland rail outage again the last few days. With more trucks on the road, there's more costs, there's delays. All of that is, is, you know, impacts across the customer, but also impacts as a nation, you know, our, uh, our commercial outcomes and how that works. So I think it's, uh, it's how do we re-engineer that critical infrastructure so it is more resilient and able to support us as we move forward. Ben? Yep, that was my number one as well. Can't be that hard, Marnie. Um, no, in, in, yeah, and I think Hamish is somewhat off the hook here. I, for me, the question on res resilience... <laughs> he's, take, he's taking notes. Yeah, he's taking, I've seen his head's down, um, taking notes. Infrastructure, and particularly rail. My, my, my second one, which is probably closely behind, is around the, the workforce. H how do we get the migration settings right? How do we get the, uh, the education? How do we get the, the right people coming through into the industry? Because there is, a, um, there, there is a lack of people coming into the industry, and it is a real point of sensitivity and point of resilience. And, and I guess the third one, if we're going down that path, which which I think then sort of gets us somewhat back on track almost. I think there is a real role for how do we get standards 
how, how do we get better standards so that we can actually communicate when so when things go wrong yeah. we, we can start actually responding and uh, coordinating that faster because at the moment everybody's working a little bit bespoke um, we're, we're, we're probably an industry that hasn't really standardized and I think if we are talking resilience that, that's probably one that is lower hanging fruit and, and a good opportunity. Can I just share a build on that I think that uh, if I think about the major impacts of COVID and the major rail outage when we lost uh, WA to the east coast for 28 days mm. I think industry came together with government to find solves and I think there's an opportunity to do more of that going forward, because I think that's, uh, you know, Team Australia at its best is how I would describe it, of everyone coming together with the common goal of, of how do we continue that supply. I think we've got to make sure we take the best of that thinking to move forward, not just when we have major outages yep. or, or impacts. Yep. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick on the issue of skills, because you've mentioned it, Ben, and it's sitting here in Pigeonhole as well and the question is around what would you recommend the skills needs for people working at the automated warehouses and fulfillment centers but I, it, it's interesting i i don't unless i've missed it i don't think skills has been mentioned today until now um but it is very clearly a key issue i mean how do you see it in the context of this specific question uh but also more broadly in terms of what what you're looking for and and who you think can kind of start to cultivate um, more of those sorts of skills. So I'll, I'll give you the answer that you'll remember, um, which is directly from our, our team down at Dandenong running our first automated shed. They, they said one of the best sources of the right skilled people are gamers. People that can sit in front of multiple screens, absorb a lot of information, doesn't really need particular uh, technical skills, doesn't need tertiary qualifications, but it's a certain aptitude and it's an ability and you can train a lot of the rest of it. So as I said, that's the one you'll probably remember. More broadly, though, I think as we go into the automated sheds, we, we do need more technology. We do need more data analytics coming through. We, we do need more of the engineers prepared to work on that. It's that mix of electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. Um, th these are very complicated computer systems, but equally very complicated uh, pieces of automation within them. So there, there's absolutely a lack of skills. And as we see more of these facilities popping up, that those types of roles and that labour is going to become more and more scarce. Kevin, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I would build to that to say that uh, we need a generation of generalists who understand across the supply chain. Mm -hmm. I think uh, historically we've had very much subject matter experts and thought of it in perhaps a more siloed approach. What things such as automation, both of uh, full cart and pick, but also e-com automation shows that you need, you need a, a generation of leaders who can think across the supply chain. And I think we see that play out more and more. And in automation, it's not just people to run the automation. It's our partners who also need a particular skill set to maintain the automation and to optimize. Because, you know, one of the things about automation is you're making long-term commitments. Therefore, you're backing yourself to be able to not only deliver what you said, but also be able to optimize. And having people who can understand that and come together to find creative solutions is really important. So I think uh, I think we see a moving of skill sets. I think, uh, and I see that in in other situations, not just automated DCs. I think about the work we've been doing around uh, advanced analytics and how you enhance it. You need people who not only are experts in advanced analytics to Ben's point and like to work with a different model, but you also need some people who understand your business who can reach into that and come together to actually create solutions that you can you can then productionize yeah, yeah. sorry yeah I'm totally aligned in fact what i've heard and the only addition and in fact kevin you actually in fact added my addition which is actually the, the diversity inclusion so the whole future of us having more data available and is there two things is actually having that diversity of thinking within those groups of people. So have the traditional um, skills or traits, so to speak, with yep. engineering, yep. but having a creative minds to actually see different colors of the insights and insights of the data that it's a, is available. I think there's that optimization cost and rationalization thinking and productivity, as well as then thinking through different colors and shades of that data that you see, because that is the future for solving those future problems. Uh, that's one. And then secondly, 
it's not a skill, it's actually a cultural um, organizational trait in those most, most successful organizations, which is about collaboration, thinking through breaking down the silos and data perspective, yeah, but also thinking through as an organization to have a common vision to make some better sense out of better service, better cost resilient uh, supply chains going forward. It's the only addition. Thanks, Sari. Um, the other top question that we have now, which, uh, really for Kevin and, and Ben around what's the commercial justification for your significant investment in, in digitization and, and what's the time frame in terms of payoffs? And I guess there's a, there's a bigger question here as well around how the business case is made internally through um, governance processes and, and is not just seen as a IT project or a supply chain project, but, but seen as, as much more fundamental to an organization. Um, Kevin, did you want to start us off on that one? Yeah, look, I, I, I think of it this way. You know, if I think about uh, automation, you know, we talk about internally about, uh, you know, half the footprint, twice the volume and a third of the operating costs. That's kind of the, you know, the, the simple ready reckoner of, of the investment you make. But I think, it, I think it's so much more than that. I think from an availability perspective for our customers, Automation gives you a certainty and an optionality to Ben's point about how you want to pick that you'd never be able to replicate in a manual DC. It also gives you a whole host of safety benefits in our manual DCs. The top three safety issues are fall from heights. In an automated DC, there's only the cranes. Yet there ain't any people in there working at the height. You can go higher because of that. Um, manual handling. So, you know, in our manual DCs, people still lift a lot of product. In an automated DC, you remove that. And then lastly, red light pullaways, which is a fancy name for when you have vehicles at the dock, making sure that it's safe to pull the vehicle away. Automated, automated sheds give you a different opportunity to restrain and control the flow of stock out. So I think it's a, not only is it a commercial, it's a good sustainability initiative, using less land, you're able to make your facility more sustainable. It's definitely safer and ultimately better for our customers end to end, as well as, you know, the opportunity to run these facilities round the clock that is difficult in a manual, manual site to do that. I think lastly, you have some optionality. If I pick our, uh, our Vitron sheds up in Queensland that we're just in the process of, uh, of opening, we're able to carry all of the range of ambient SKUs in Queensland for the first time. Up to this point, we've had to carry some of the SKUs in Queensland and some of it in New South Wales. There's just a, you know, <clears throat> a law of geography of uh, how many hours drive it is or how long it is on the train from New South Wales to Queensland to be able to hold it together. You then get to build pallets for the stores that contain all of the SKUs. To Ben's earlier point, all of the biscuits together because all of the biscuits are in the DC together. So I think I think there's a number of commercial fundamentals. Of course, uh, I'm not going to share what the business case is, and I know I've got lots of good legal advice in the in the audience. But I think the uh, the investment when you're doing any infrastructure, these are long term investments. If I think about our conversation in calls around stores around our uh, long-term contracts, you are seeing them through for the long-term. And I think automation's the same. Ben? Yeah, look, I, I won't build on Kevin's answer. I think very similar for us. Maybe the perspective I'd also add is you've got to think about what are the implications of not making that investment. So as your business is growing, as volumes are increasing, you need to continue supplying. If you don't make some of those decisions and then it's a manual versus an automated for all the good reasons about why you automate, your supply chain gets more and more fragmented and all of these benefits we're talking about, they actually, they, they get harder to achieve. Your, your transport networks get fragmented. Your store outcomes are poorer. So that there's a lot of good reasons why you would go and invest in the first place. And then once you get to that decision to invest, actually you're making the call about, well, do I, do I want the more efficient automated site or do I want to continue doing what I've always done? And then you start to do your numbers around that. So that's maybe just a little bit more color to what, what, is your, what is your counter for that investment? So from a business case perspective, lifting up back from transport logistics and warehousing to actually as a corporate. So coming back to the research that talked about Accenture does every two years on the companies, 
And the leaders have been actually investing that 3.9% of their sales to their digital capability. So some of the hardcore facts of through that quantitative research um, I do have, which is actually quite interesting, which look, re, listening to Kevin is actually almost summarizing some of these and I'm not sure your numbers, but there is examples of the benefits of, it's not only must do, but there are some quantification of these. So 29% improvement on labor productivity, um, OE up by 31%, those were just looking at digital manufacturing capability through enabling, uh, for instance, um, a manufacturing control tower and collecting data, having sensors automation in your manufacturing line. It also, there's a claim benefit on reduction on scope one and two, having the better accurate data available. So therefore you can manage those direct impacts of your direct operations of, of high your energy use it's by minus 27%. And, the last, which is interesting, is profitability. So profit level uh, going from, from these thousand uh, sample companies from 3.1%, this is astonishing, but it's 6.3% in five years time. So first year, usually the return is in about 1.9% improvement in profitability. So these are some of the quantification of the actual, not only it's a must do, but there are some actually business case benefits of these thousand companies collected there, like, and, and that's how it looks as it currently stands. All right, we have come to time. Uh, some fantastic questions. I mean, we've covered cybersecurity, data standards, the commercial case, we've talked about skills, we've talked about um, regulation and infrastructure investments. So we've covered a lot of territory in 40 minutes. Um, so fantastic discussion. Uh, could you please join with me in thanking uh, Hamish, Kevin, Sari, and Ben. So uh, as per the tag team, I now want to welcome Melinda back for the next panel uh, on ESG and supply chains. I wasn't joking when I said we were doing the tag team. Okay, I'm going to introduce some speakers and then while they're coming up, I'm going to change things up just a little bit. So joining me on stage for our final panel discussion of the day, which is uh, looking at the topic of ESG and supply chains, I have Sonia Sharma, who is a partner with Maddox, and Jody Bracou, who is uh, the Circular Economy Leader at Oricon. Now, um, we've been relying a lot on pigeonhole, and I know it's very convenient, but I'm also um, advised by my wonderful team at the back that we have microphones in the room. I'm putting my glasses on so I can see Hermione. So I'm just giving you advance notice that I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so anyone who's been paying attention to the pigeonhole questions, maybe would have picked up on the fact that ESG and sustainability has cropped up in almost every session that we've um, talked about so far. Um, and one of the questions had, had, had Hermione's name and, a, and a, a question specifically directed to you on this topic. So I thought I'd just give you the heads up and we'll have a bit of a conversation on stage. And when you're least expecting it, then I'm going to jump up and say over to you. But um, if you want to ask questions, we've got about 40 minutes for this session, so put them in a pigeonhole, but I am going to take a bit of a pause, and if you want to ask a question, throw your hand up as well, and if you're feeling like you need to move around, you can jump up and ask your question, which also means that you avoid the scrutiny of your uh, colleagues. So if you really want to ask a question and you, you're not sure how people are going to vote on it, I'd suggest put your hand up. Um, trick for the system. Okay, now... You can, I've got to put my glasses on to see you, but not our lovely panellists. Um, clearly, everyone's interested in ESG, lots of talk about it in all sorts of um, different frames, including um, in supply chain. I think the shifting expectations of consumers and other stakeholders, investors around how businesses need to think about their supply chain, how they think about procurement and due diligence has been another standout feature of, if you like, of transformational change in the last five or so years. Um, Sonia, I'm going to start with you. In Australia, uh, in particular, um, a lot of focus around ethical supply chains, particularly as it relates to human rights. Yeah. 
and of course, you know, really tied to the modern slavery um, requirements and, and legislation. Where do you think Australia sits in the sort of landscape, the global landscape on it, on its efforts and focus on these issues? I mean, it's such an interesting question. And I think this is a theme that's come out of the discussion today, uh, which is the accelerated change we've seen over the last four to five years. You know, I've been a lawyer for 14 years uh, or longer, and this is just not a topic of conversation, anti-modern slavery. It was just not a practice that we mm. practice in. In terms of Australia's position on this, it's quite interesting. The coalition government decided to take a global, you know, world-leading approach. And when it released or enacted its modern slavery reporting legislation, it did something which, which was quite interesting, which was a world first government register where you know entities who reached that reporting threshold had to you know submit their modern slavery statement identifying their risks identifying what they're doing about modern slavery and submit it onto a public register that didn't exist anywhere else in the world and the idea behind that was to have openness and transparency and create a race to the top and it was quite interesting to see the journey so far. So when the laws were first introduced four years ago, there was a lot of non-compliance. There was a lot of articles or Monash did a study saying, you know, entities were really taking a box ticking approach to the issue. And I think that's still a, a question, are we, are we taking a box ticking approach to this? But what we've seen is I think a rapid development and maturity mm -hmm. around the issue. So I do think Australian organisations have you know, have changed with this legislation being a key driver to it. It's only a reporting legislation. I think we need to talk about that too. But I think it has driven change. And Monash, again, when it released its report, has said that we have a clear leaderboard emerging. And, you know, some of the people who are in the room today who are on that leaderboard. Um, it's, it's companies like CBA, Woolworths, um, others and we've seen a, a significant improvement in disclosure so Australia in terms of reporting requirements is actually leading the way globally when it comes to modern slavery and transparency so I think that's quite an interesting you know it's, it's interesting for a small country to be doing that mm. and the world is watching what we're doing so the UK has had legislation for some time they're looking to uplift to where we're at yeah. One of the things that we've established at CEDA is an ESG community of practice, mm. community of best practice. And to your point around, you know, trying to put um, a spotlight on this and get a race to the top, one of the, the real purposes of that community is to share information, yeah. um, to, to build collaboration and to get people working together um, so that they move up the learning curve as quickly as possible. Do you think that's what's happened in this space with, with such a, you know, a, a sudden shift, if you like, to the reporting requirements and that visibility on it? I think that has been a huge driver. And I, I mean, it's amazing to see, you know, Coles and Woolworths on the same stage here today. I was like, that, that's, that's incredible. And I think that is something that is happening in the modern slavery space because supply chains are so complex. So, what we need to see is that collaboration because in order to get that visibility further down the supply chain, you can't do it on your own. There needs to be sharing. And what I know also from working with clients in this space is they're wanting to learn and sometimes you need to look outside of your sector to learn how to do this. How do you actually operationalise, you know, this risk assessment? How do you actually identify risks and you have to look at people who have been there before and work out whether you know what they're doing might apply to your sector so collaboration is really key but not just within industry what we see as being really effective is you need that, that collaboration with NGOs and civil society on the ground mm. that is so critical in this space because at the end of the day when we talk about modern slavery risks we're not talking about risk to the organisation. We're talking about risks to the individual who is the victim of modern slavery. And that's, you know, that's we sitting here, that's very difficult for us to understand. Mm. So we need to be able to collaborate with NGOs who are on the ground and who might be able to advise an entity on 
how to deal with if there's an issue on the ground. How do you deal with that? So let's talk about a practical scenario. If you found that your supplier or sub-supplier had confiscated passports from workers, how do we deal with that? Because reporting it to police in a particular country might actually put those workers mm. at more risk. So there's a need to collaborate with experts, not, not only, you know, government, but also NGOs, civil society groups and industry. And that's another theme I think that's come out of today's discussion. And, and the government recognises this in importance of collaboration so in, in terms of you know the identification of the risks yeah. as well as the the remediation or how do you deal with them mm. yeah um Jody questions come through straight away on pigeonhole but also it's kind of what I was going to ask you next so let's go there um what does a circular economy look like in the context of supply chain like how does circular economy fit into our supply chain thinking um, and supply chain solutions great question it is so intricately mixed with supply chain and it was really delightful for me to be invited here today to talk at a supply chain conference um, at Oricon we've set up a, a climate change and sustainability group that's actually kind of set up around different risk areas of climate change so you've got your physical risk your transition risk how do we decarbonize and a lot of what we talk about is circular economy actually being really shedding the light on that supply chain risk actually because a lot of people think of circular economy as being about waste but waste is just that kind of tip of the iceberg it's the part that you see um, it's deeper down into how do we manufacture and produce all the materials and products and assets that are around us and then how do we keep them at higher value for as long as possible once we've manufactured them so they actually don't become waste mm. if possible and there's a whole lot of elements around implementing circular economy that principles that is all about reverse logistics as well so if we are getting stuff out into the public or out into our businesses how do we get them back Mm. and do things with them again and it's just as complex or uh, uh, more complex getting things back than actually getting things out in one direction so supply chain is like you guys are going to be the core people making a circular economy happen and um, whether you like it or not um, and the government has actually announced that you know we want Australia to be a circular economy by 2030 um, no idea how they will measure it or enforce <laughs> it but you know, supply chain experts are going to be really key in in making that happen. So, so are you saying that we've? So we we typically think of the supply chain as one direction, if you like. Yeah. Producer to consumer, and now what we're saying is you've got to go. You've got to literally make the supply chain circular, so it's consumer back to producer. Yep. So it's this big, messy. I like to show when I'm presenting a slide. Often when you hear about circular economy, you see um, you see a diagram of a linear economy where we take, make, um, use and dispose of goods and it mm. kind of goes down in a circle. And then you see a nice little roundabout where you where it, the circle loops back in on itself with recycling, which is a great kind of um, diagram to explain what happens with your water bottles here and how they can come back and become bottles again. But in the real world where we're in, um, I usually show a, pres a, a slide. Has anyone seen the magic roundabout in Swindon? No, it's the best thing. I, I work in an engineering company, so like I have to do this. But it's basically seven roundabouts that feed into each other. So the cars like loop through a first roundabout, then go through the middle roundabout, then go through the... And I love it because that's what our messy world looks like, much more than this one nice little simple bottle that comes back to being bottled. Mm. We have goods and products coming in one door and flowing out another door and getting highest value over there. And, you know, that's what we've been talking about all day, right? The systems mm. and the, and the comp complex systems. Hermione talked about that a lot of, of um, supply chains. And it's not just a nice direct thing and then mm. coming back it's actually how do we get these goods and materials flowing through the economy to where they're needed most and something we talk about quite a lot in circular economy um so if you guys can help me get this vocabulary out that would be great as well we sort of like talking about supply chain as as everything to get that product in front of you or get that that object in front of you and then we we talk about value chain to be the extension of that so how do we repair it how do we keep it 
may change? How do we manufacture it longer? How do we get it back? How do we remanufacture? So that investment in local manufacturing of, of goods that are actually using recycled materials. So thinking of yourself as being supply chain, but also part of that larger value chain, I think mm. is really useful. So um, I've just got a pitch there, Donna, for you around um, remanufacturing in your modern manufacturing um, it's there, national right? reconstruction fund. So it's there. Um, <laughs> It, it's interesting because I think you, you mentioned waste and I, I think it's absolutely true that we tend to think about um, circular economy a lot in the waste context and in terms of recycling um, waste. And, and I think there's, if I, then what happens is you tend to focus on the failures really of, that we've heard a lot about recently around circular economy, but can we turn that on its head and use that as, a, as an opportunity to drive a more sophisticated circular economy conversation? Oh, absolutely. It's really exciting. Um, I was actually quite happy with what happened with Red Cycle. Um, is this getting Zoomed like live to everyone? So I felt like Red we Cycle will, was... We will put that on Twitter, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, Red Cycle was a wonderful feel-good system, and I think it was a lovely get-out-of-jail-free card for everyone. So we can just put this little sticker on our plastic bags and go, nothing to see here. We've got it sorted because we've got this great business that's trying to save the world that's going to cover it for all plastic bags across Australia. Um, and, and I think it was a bit too easy to just put that sticker on a bag and, and you know, give it back to Coles and Woolworths. And it was a really effective example of a collection system where shops were integrated into that. But it didn't have all those value points and it wasn't scaled up to mm. work at an Australian wide scale. So as we're looking, we don't want these nice little niche feel good examples anymore. We need uh, real manufacturing systems that work at scale for our entire country. So seeing some of the things fail, it's actually, you know, it's when you guys saw your supply chains fail that everyone stood up and went oh supply chains are important we need to talk about resilience we need to talk about how and and that's so relevant for what's going to happen in the future with climate change and as more boats sink and things like that so sometimes when they break visibly it can be better for people in our sector to actually start treating the root cause and treating it as a real issue okay jack if you make your way over to hermione I'm going to ask the whole audience a, qu a question. Um, I'm going to ask the whole audience a question, then I'm going to ask Hermione a question. Honest answer now. Who who felt better about the plastics recycling when you sort of got all your plastic bags and took them back to Coles and didn't think too much about the effectiveness? We call it wish cycling. <laughs> it was so good was I didn't have to make any tough decisions about how much plastic was coming into the house I didn't have to you know get stuck into the kids about too much packaging it was all so easy just to take it all back to the supermarket uh, not so easy Hermione the question I had for you was and this was not my question it was from Pigeonhole um, how can we make supply chains more sustainable in 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 two minutes or less what would, what would you what would be your fo the, the top thing that you would focus on well, just like everyone else has had, I'm going to have a number of top things to say. <laughs> that's, a, that's how to make them more sustainable. Well, the first thing is we need people and we need them to be knowledgeable, skilled, and they need to understand the complex systems that they're dealing with. Australia is woefully behind. Our education system is woefully inadequate. University, postgraduate, undergraduate, and vocational education. So one, to make it sustainable, make sure people who are in this space know what they're talking about. Within that, because lots of people know about supply chain now, which is fabulous, we need to make sure government people have new understanding, knowledge and capability that is very serious in terms of credentials. We need to build. So that's the first thing for sustainable. The second thing for sustainable, what a wonderful question. And I've got a microphone. Good grief. <laughs> oh, joy, oh, joy. The second thing would have to be, um, we ha because we're talking with ESG, we're, we're, okay, you asked the question, Jody. no one's recording this. We're a pretty dumb nation. We've got 50% of our population that are hardly involved in this wonderful industry called supply chain. I love the way you described it too, Jody. spot on. We, we are so silly that we are not, really bringing in global diversity into this industry. You know, we have a program called Wayfinder. We have 150 careers from base salary 
and we finish at um, executive management 250,000 a year. We, these 150 roles, 18 sectors, one is a truck driver, one is a train driver, one is a train signaller. The other 147 also need people who are educated and are knowledgeable and skilled. So we also, uh, I think that's a terribly important thing about diversity. Uh, I won't hog it anymore, but to say in terms of environmental issues, decarbonisation, fuel security is a number one huge issue for our country. Danger, danger, risk, risk, risk. It's a big issue. Decarbonisation is incredibly important in terms of fuel diversity. We need to bring in the renewals, new renewables. And I think that I've been very disappointed by working across the jurisdictions uh, of Australia to hear this constant thing that government is prioritising cars over uh, trucks, trains, right. freight, anything moving, substantial equipment. It's just crazy. So I think the decarbonisation issue in terms of the renewable energy, and that reduces our risk on fuel, uh, petrol as it is, I think they're the main things. So skills, diversity and fuel diversification. I think the energy and fuel, yes, yep. I think so. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sonia, you talked, um, when we're looking at modern slavery, about uh, tracking back through your supply chain, yeah. right? How can we use this experience with modern slavery, which has been sort of turbocharged, as you said, and where we were sort of ahead of the game, uh, to, in to encourage the sort of development of, of skills and expertise in, in going end-to-end -end supply chain and using that to think about ESG more broadly? I mean, it's so interesting, isn't it? Like, I was so fascinated by the, the digital transformation discussion that we had before. But what one slavery does, it makes us look at what way, if the supply chain doesn't end with your, you know, supplier here, it goes way back to, to the worker. And I think having that visibility through the sort of digital technologies and all of those things is so is so critical. What's interesting about modern slavery as well is it's one of the first regulated pillars of ESG. So it's a test case. And I think what we're seeing is the importance of technology in being able to track the visibility of our supply chains. And I think that's going to be something that for all of the pillars of ESG is going to be critical. And so I think as well, what was really interesting was this discussion of not looking at things in isolation. So I was so fascinated by the earlier discussion because I'm actually a cybersecurity lawyer as well. That's also mm -hmm. what I do. That's my other wheelhouse. And I think the reason those two things fit so well together is they're both about supply chain. So we have to stop looking at things in isolation. And with the E and the S and the G, mm. it's like, how do you bring those together as an organisation? And you sort of, you do need to be looking at them separately, but it's like, it's, it's bringing it together. And I think the sort of the, the digitisation and that data point is going to be so critical to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a whole new sort of ecosystem way of thinking, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's, we're having to, you know, and I think this discussion has, that's been a big theme that's come out of, all of the discussions is that we have to sort of change the way where we we think yeah. which is quite you know it's quite difficult like previously I think someone said something fantastic which was we tend to be quite self-interested but the way the world is heading and the focus on companies you know actually looking at ESG as an issue it requires you not to be self-interested it, it requires this sort of collaboration and I don't know if you've got thoughts on that as well but it's, I think it's a different way of thinking self-interested I, I love talking about how companies can collaborate in um, non-competitive areas where it just benefits everyone and mm. supply chain can sometimes be part of that right if we can all work together to share stock to share assets things like that we can you know the rising tide lifts all boats and being able to collaborate in these areas and um I, I ran a um, industrial ecology cluster in France for a couple of years where it was working with a bunch of, of businesses, um, you know, like literally in a, a business park uh, and trying to find areas where they all had the same problems. And if we worked together, we could 
you know, find really great solutions that were cheaper, easier. And, you know, it started with us uh, picking up e-waste and getting documents destroyed and recycled together and things like that. But as companies build trust working on these little um, non-competitive areas, they actually found other ways that they could work together and collaborate as well. So having those zones that I think it can still be self-interested to collaborate. Yes, yeah. I think it, it makes us go better. And we talk a lot as well, what you were saying about the um, that, that tough thing that we have to do in terms of thinking in systems, but being really good at our area at the same time. And we're all working on really we talk about becoming T-shaped professionals, right? That we've all got like a deep um, expertise area that's our schmick, but we need to understand how it links into everyone else as well. And that's, a, I think it's a really big skill these days. We, we talk about some of the extra skills we need. It's not good enough to just have that depth in your field anymore. You've got to really figure out how it connects into everyone else. Mm. And that's the sort of stakeholder engagement piece, isn't it? That that Sonia, you were talking about as well, that not just living in your silo, but actually kind of understanding the different yeah. perspectives and expectations and actually tack, ties in nicely to Hermione's comment about diversity, which is yeah. having you think more broadly. Any questions in the room? Otherwise I'm gonna I'm gonna resort back to pigeonhole. Sounds like a bad thing. Be brave, please. Uh, Solar. Yeah. 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 It's it's you know it's it's an excellent question, and at the end of the day, the the current modern slavery reporting regime it's merely a reporting regime. It doesn't have financial penalties under it. It's under review at this stage. So the government's looking at things like financial penalties. It's looking at you know does it need to take more of a role. If we look at other what's happening overseas with um, the Uyghur Force um, Labor Act in the US and also in the e EU, there's there's a, going to be uh, laws around actually conducting human rights due diligence. My sense is that the laws, the the way the government is going to come into play is we'll see a shift in these softer laws moving to harder laws where organisations actually have to undertake human rights due diligence. I think that's where we're heading. I absolutely do think there is a role for government to play and we can see that in other sectors or industries where, you know, you've got a really strong regulator such as the ACCC and they're, they're, they're out there and, and I think that can be very effective. Um, so I, I do think what we're likely to see is a sh globally and in Australia is a shift in legislation where we're moving from softer sort of reporting obligations to mandatory, um, you know, due diligence obligations in both the the e space and the the and in the sort of modern slavery space as well. Uh, to date, the government's played a fairly, you know, it has been monitoring the modern slavery statements, has been issuing a lot of guidance, but it, 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 it really doesn't have a lot of teeth, the regulator in Australia at the moment. So let me open this up to a broader conversation that, for, for both of you, because I think there's this tension between, um, you know, it feels good, we want to be doing different yeah. things and all the rest of it. Um, reporting's great, a bit of transparency, but how do we, you know, how do we make sure it's real? Yeah. And there's balance between um, sort of voluntary approaches and and reporting versus uh, regulatory or legislative um, obligations that have more teeth. And I'm going to extend it a little bit more 
because from my perspective, particularly in these areas that are evolving quickly, the challenge is how do you get the mandatory component right and not um, discourage innovation and, and new approaches and risk taking? So th thoughts on that big topic? Maybe Jodie, I'll start with you. And Lots of thoughts. Um, it was a big learning curve for me. I was working in France in 2013, I think, when um, the EU had just proposed a, a series of laws around circular economy. Um, and there was a bit of a shuffle of, in the cabinet and they, they pulled down the laws. They, they, they decided that no one would care if they retracted them. Um, but actually there was this groundswell of business that lobbied legislators to bring laws back in because European businesses were seeing circular economy related laws as critical to their competitivity and a way that they could battle against cheap um, Chinese imports and such. So it was really interesting. That was the first time I'd really seen business, you know, being, being in Aussie, that's not something you see frequently. Businesses bashing down the door, asking for more and more stringent environmental regu regulation so that they could actually compete better on a global marketplace. So it's really interesting seeing how that, that kind of interconnectedness between business and, and government and how they can support each other in this and that the best business people should be pushing for that as well. But that question around how do we um, enable um, experimentation and, and testing, that's always been a really big issue in our space as well. Because, for example, once something's labelled a, a waste, you might not be able to do so much with it. You might not be able to develop new things. You might not be able to test new things. So that's space to prototype, to test, um, to create exceptions to the rules. You can give something a crack and actually document and test and prove whether it works or not whether it works or not is incredibly important and some of the things that the the kind of the big movements in Europe that I saw that worked the best were actually where governments went out and said we want to experiment something and we want you all to give it a crack and let us know what works and what doesn't mm -hmm. and actually if you if you did the experiment and it didn't work that was just as valuable as what did work what does work you try to replicate it and do your best practice but what doesn't work it's like oh okay so there's a piece of reglementation that's in your way there's an infrastructure that's missing and things like that and I don't think we've quite got that attitude here that that actually tell us what's not working and and fail fast and feed that information back up to get the system working better. Mm. Sonia any thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, I might speak on what I see works really well with clients and the ones who are doing more than box ticking and, and I think sort of having a real impact and change. They're really intentional about it. The With modern slavery, the, prob, the if you're looking at a complex supply chain, you cannot tackle everything at once. They have a really good understanding of where their leverage is. They understand you know, where their risk is and where they're, they're able to work with their suppliers to, to make real change. And that's where the innovation occurs because they're able to work with their supply chain in a, in a manner where they have the most leverage. And that's where you learn new things. And through learning through your suppliers, that's where opportunity comes from. That's where you're able to discover new things. So I, my advice would be, if this is a problem that you're tackling, you have to have you have to be super intentional about it having a framework about well what are we going to focus on first with risk because you can't do it all at once mm. so so that would be and that's where i think the opportunities for innovation occur where you're collaborating really closely with your supply chain because you're learning that information yeah i think another really good call out too that sits within your answer is looking for the opportunity and not just the the cost if you like it's thinking yeah. about risk you know both as um, you know, the opportunity, opportunity cost, as well as, um, you know, what you shouldn't be doing or what you can't do or what, you know, is not permissive, is permissive, permissible. Sorry. And Jody. two things that came up earlier, someone talked about the risk of not acting yes. as well. The risk of inaction is now just as important or more so of the risk of acting. Um, and secondly, I think it was Hermione again that talked about people chasing shiny things. And I think people do that in the E and the S space because there's a lot of feel good out there, right? So, mm -hmm. oh, here I've just learned about this recycled product. Let's do that. And I've just heard about this social business. Let's quickly go by there. And they forget that basic 
business approach to prioritization and what's going to have the biggest impact and what do you leverage um so i really push our clients to, to focus on that like do you have a good strong business approach to making decisions about environmental management it's just as important what what do your customers care about what do your stakeholders care about what can you and can't you achieve and where, where's your impact going to come from that's not being cold-hearted that's actually how you're going to be able to make bigger impact as a, as a company and a system. Oh, and sustained change. Um, I've got a question for you from the audience. Um, what should investment, what, what investment should be prioritised to drive the transition to circularity by 2030? Oh, that's so tricky. So I get to do the three point response again. Um, infrastructure and infrastructure across the supply chain is going to be so important. Um, we need space to do things. We need to be able to move goods, products from left to right and right to left where they can be used best. Um, the whole capacity building and skills is just so, so massive and so, so lacking. Um, so that is a really big investment. If we can get people seeing this and having the skills to be able to do something about it and the infrastructure to make it happen, I think data is a really big one as well. Um, in a lot of areas, we just seem to be walking in the in the blind. We don't know where our impacts are coming from. We don't know where our goods and materials are coming from and we don't know how to get them back and use them in the right thing. So um, one, I think, there's a, an architect in the Netherlands that always talks about waste as being a material that's lost its identity, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know what it is anymore. We're not quite sure where it can go. So that data pace is a really massive one for circular economy as well. Sonia, do you think customers, this is, this is not my question, this is a tricky one, I think. Do you think um, consumers are happy to pay premiums if companies are compliant with modern slavery? Well, it's a great question. I, I think that consumer pressure has driven some of the some of these laws and where we are now. And I think it's with the environment and modern slavery. I think consumers, well, they're looking for two things. One, I think they're they're absolutely looking at it more, but they're also looking for organizations to be efficient. And we're in a really, you know, the cost of living is so high at the moment. It's a real pressure for consumers. It's not an easy. It's it's not an easy um, problem to solve, mm. but I don't think it's going to go away. I have two young kids, and they are absolutely interested in where their products come from. They are so in tune with the environment. We know that as a generational issue that that is important. So looking towards the future, we can't ignore these these issues. Like they're there's something that we're going to have to deal with. And I think absolutely, I mean, I personally do pay a premium for products. I'm very susceptible to greenwashing, but I, I will I will pay a premium. <laughs> I'll pay a premium for a product, but I'm in a very privileged position. And I acknowledge that my I'm in a very privileged position. I, I can do that. But I do think that consumer pressure is what has driven some of these changes. Um, and it's going to continue to do so. But consumers are also looking for efficiency. And so it's how do we do it efficiently? Can I just say, and actually, if we can have a show of hands too, for those of you who have kids, my kids are very concerned about it when I'm paying. <laughs> <laughs> that is the honest truth. Um, and I, I'm happy for that to be uh, uh, conveyed to them. Um, <laughs> Final question, we've got about five minutes. Um, I'm really interested, and maybe Jodie, I'll start with you. You talked about um, businesses in Europe actually wanting governments to um, put stronger parameters around, you know, ESG issues, circularity to and sort of bolster their own competitiveness. It's interesting, it's a slight tangent, but I've been doing some work on responsible AI and there are definitely areas where some businesses are looking for government to put some markers down about what not to do because it's such a fast moving and complicated area that quite frankly, a cost effective way to sort of maintain your reputation is to have someone draw the line for you. Um, but So how important do you think ESG is and whether it's circular and however you want to describe it, how important is that for business competitiveness for the future? I think it's incredibly important. There's a whole social license to operate element that's that's really important that um, a lot of um, 
communities or stakeholders just don't want businesses to be doing bad stuff. Like it's quite, it's quite simple. The problem is they don't see everything everywhere. So it's one thing when it's neighbours living next to a factory and they can see pollution, they can see things like that. Traditionally, you know, things go offshore. So how, how do they know what's happening in the supply chain? after that and how do they allow and we're seeing such a wave of um, backlash against greenwashing and the ACCC calling out businesses on it I think there was a time where you could just kind of wash over things a little bit um, and pay lip service to some of these issues and that's uh, very quickly uh, moving away so I think that's really shifting the dial on what's happening I think having hard targets is so critical. So in Australia, where things have moved the most um, around circular economy, for example, is in packaging and food. And that's no coincidence because that's the only place where there's been hard uh, targets placed at a national level. So we've seen massive changes in the way our packaging looks, you know, still imperfect, but it's moved. Um, and the, the fight to cut food waste by half has really moved enormously the way companies deal with this. Um, so that, that's something that can't be ignored. And then of course, uh, net zero. So the next massive, massive challenge of every company everywhere is how the heck do we get to net zero? How do we decarbonize? And you can't do that without understanding your, your supply chain, where your impacts are coming from. Um, and you can't just kind of ignore that anymore. I think it's almost like carbon dioxide has become another proxy for a dollar symbol when we're putting together business cases and things. And that's been a massive shift, you know, five years ago, comparing cost to carbon wasn't even a thing. And now, you know, every business case needs a carbon kind of element to it as well. So I'm, I'm really seeing that it's not something that can be ignored anymore. And there's been a massive shift in Australia and globally over the past five years in that area. Sonia? I, I mean, I think we're in a really interesting space at the moment. It's like, where are we? Are we are we box ticking or are we making real change? And I think so. My sort of closing reflections, if I might, is organisations, government, we all have to be sort of looking at making meaningful change. And it's like, how do we how do we go about that? Um, and it's been such an interesting discussion, sort of hearing from everyone today mm. on the supply chain and each and, and the impacts across all of it yeah I, I guess um to sort of close out um it, it, we did some work at cedar a couple of years ago uh we did a survey actually broad community survey called company pulse where which was looking at the expectations on business uh and um the one question that really stood out to me was you know did did survey respondents expect that businesses would mainly look after their financial performance or, you know, what should they be looking at? And the result was just emphatic that the community expectation was that business would care equally about its financial, social and environmental um, impacts um, and performance. And, you know, ever since then, we've sort of been, you know, really thinking about how that, in, you know, intersects with CEDA's work. Um, and I think there's there is cynicism um, around what business does and what they talk about and what they say they're doing as distinct from what they are doing. But the expectations are, are really have been really clearly articulated to us. Um, just a moment of self-promotion here. I mean, I did mention we've got the ESG community of best practice. That is really about helping members work together to share information um, and to lift all boats um, because that's, you know, our, our view is that's where community expectations are and if we're going to support a strong economy um, and push for economic reforms then the community expectations have to fit within that so that's the sort of under underpinnings of that um, and we've also developed some learning modules for um, for uh, members and non-members actually on basic ESG fundamentals so two things that we're trying to do to add value to our members um, in, in how they're sort of um, engaging with what we see as a pretty important issue that is now firmly underpinning uh, economic development. So thank you both for your perspectives uh, today. Could you join me in thanking our panellists? <laughs>
so I'm very conscious that that's, uh, that's exactly what I'm doing. So um, I'll uh, be relatively brief. That feels like a bit like a hard act to follow in this afternoon. I apologise I missed the this morning sessions, but um, this afternoon uh, has been great. Um, I think one thing is true that uh, the world is getting more and more complex and uh, supply chain, uh, chain uh, is uh, a microcosm of that. Uh, I think we all feel like we're on Jody's um, carousel from time to time um, as we go round and round and round trying to work through these things. Um, so thanks, Belinda. And um, uh, Maddox is really pleased to be associated with uh, today's event um, as uh, one of Australia's leading law firms where uh, very conscious that uh, supply chain management is very high on um, our client's agenda uh, together with ESG which we just we just heard about we know that it's uh, one of those things that that keeps people awake at night so today we've been really lucky to hear from uh, a range of industry and thought leaders around how organizations and government are responding uh, supply chain um, disruptions risk uh, and how we're using technology to uh, address those I think as the world's got smaller over the past decades, um, Australia uh, as a relatively small and geographically uh, isolated country has benefited from uh, access to international markets. But in recent years, uh, we've been reminded just how fragile, fragile the connection to those markets can be. And even prior um, uh, to the global pandemic, uh, we we're seeing interruptions to those, those supply chains via geopolitical issues, um, armed conflicts, uh, um, weather events, uh, cyber attacks, and uh, even maritime incidents which close off vital trade routes from Europe. The uncertainty around those supply chains obviously impacted on uh, the cost of doing business and the uncertainty around uh, delivery of projects in a timely manner. But the complication is, mount is, is increased, I guess, by uh, businesses not just being concerned about uh, ensuring supply, but in making sure that supply is done in a legal and ethical manner um, in the way that we've heard from Sonia and Jody uh, just then, uh, to ensure that um, the production of uh, goods that are being purchased are done in an ethical way uh, and that data around the supply chain is managed appropriately. Obviously, the environmental impact of how uh, goods and services are sourced as well remains an issue for all of us as we, as we manage this landscape. As we're happily, hopefully, emerging from uh, the last few years of the pandemic, uh, we're seeing supply chains open up a bit more, um, but they still remain attendant to a whole range of risks. Um, uh, and that these risks are being proactively managed by government and businesses, and it's conferences like these and discussions like these that are really important to make sure that um, we all rise on the tide, I think, Melinda, as you said, not just in relation to ESG, but in relation to, to managing these risks. So Maddox has been advising uh, both private and public sector clients on all aspects of the supply chain, uh, both domestic and international, um, and increasingly so, as I mentioned before, it's one of those key issues that uh, are keeping uh, is keeping our clients awake. So advising our clients with both contractual risks, the meeting regulatory requirements, the cross-border legal issues, uh, the chain of responsibility for transport arrangements, uh, modern slavery, of course, which Sonia has just, just spoken about and which is increasingly an issue for our clients. Our clients have been looking at different ways, different procurement models, um, and clients are rethinking about how they engage with the supply chain and the players in the supply chain to ensure that their, their interests are protected. Um, but we've, we've found that collaborative engagement is ultimately the key to ensuring that those risks are minimised. And it's not just uh, single areas of, of the firm or, uh, or, or, or single legal issues that are at play here. We have our construction, leasing, commercial, uh, Sony's TMT team, um, all dealing with aspects of the supply chain in a particular way. So we're very pr proud to be part of our conversation today with, with everybody here, and I look forward to being at the forefront of these discussions with Cedar and with our clients. So I'd like to thank Cedar for hosting uh, today, and, as, and um, on behalf of uh, Cedar and all the other sponsors, uh, thank everyone uh, for coming, and particularly thanking uh, all of the speakers who've given up their time to contribute to the conversation. Uh, I know sometimes uh, is, is an effort, but it's certainly appreciated by, by all of us. Um, and uh, thank you once more. Thank Thanks, you David. Hey, thanks, David. And thank you again to Maddox for your support for today and also to the speakers and to Accenture Australia, um, not just today, but for all, all of the work that we do. Um, the team and I really appreciate it. Um, I did also just want to take a... a, a brief moment to say thanks to the team. 
um, uh, we've been referring to the last sort of five weeks in-house as mega March uh, because there have been a ton of events and two conferences and uh, the treasurer and 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 it's just been a, um, a pretty big month for the team. So I did, um, as we head off to Easter at the end of the week, just want to take the opportunity to thank them for, for all of their hard work. If you wouldn't mind just joining me and giving them a quick, quick back. Um, it was mega March, but then it is going to be marvellous May um, for anyone who's, who has not been to a state budget address here in Victoria and seen the Honourable Tim Pallas. You're missing something. Um, he's back on our stage on the 25th of May, if you're interested in that. And then we've got later uh, in early June, um, the Honourable Stephen Jones, who's talking about the consumer data right, which uh, is actually a really important uh, reform and sort of sits alongside of many of the things that we were talking about today. Uh, with that, it's my um, thanks to you for being here with us today and drinks will be served. Uh, please do stay and, and enjoy a conversation. Thank you again. <laughs>